we are live. Good evening. Welcome, everybody, to the uh, March Committee of the Whole Operations meeting. And I'd ask everyone to stand as you're able as I read the indication. As we come together today, we recognize the great responsibilities laid upon us. Our council will always strive to understand the needs of the people we serve and to use power wisely and well. Our purpose is to establish and maintain a city of prosperity and righteousness where freedom prevails and where justice rules. Let us also not forget those who've served our community and who are no longer are with us so we can continue to do the work that we must in their memory. Please be seated. So, Mr. Deputy Clerk, have you uh, taken the roll call? Or will you take the roll call? Through the chair, roll call's been taken. All right. And I'd like the viewers to note that Councillor Utley is unable to join us tonight. He has a, a family matter he needs to attend to. I'd like to remind members of council staff and our viewing public of the electronic participation policy. For those staff and delegates joining electronically, please keep your video and microphones off until requested to do so by the chair or members of council. All rules for delegations under the city's procedural bylaw otherwise apply. So we'll now move to item three, declaration of conflict of interest. Members of the committee, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest for items appearing on the agenda? I'll declare, uh, I'm gonna declare a conflict in respect to the zero vision, zero report, 6.1.5, item three recommendations made regarding the Echo Place neighborhood review. Uh, I really don't think I've got a pecuniary interest, but because I live in that neighborhood, I think it's appropriate I take the safe course of action and declare that conflict. And Council McCurry, I'm gonna ask that uh, you take the chair when we're dealing with that matter, if you, would, if you wouldn't mind, please. So let's deal now with uh, the items that are be automatically separated. Item 6.1.2, which is the Elgin Street multi-use path. That'll be separated because we do have a delegation. Uh, 6.1.5, the Vision Zero Road Safety Committee report is also going to be separated due to the conflict I just declared. So members, is there anything else you want separated for discussion purposes this evening? Anyone in the council chamber? Anyone through Zoom? Saying none. So, Councillor Sicoli, I understand you have the motion to approve all items for consideration, consent that haven't been separated for discussion purposes. So, would you please read your motion, State Your Secretary? Thank you. Uh, moved by myself, seconded by my ward mate, Councillor Vanderstelt, that all items contained for consideration or consent 6.1 and 6.2, not separated for discussion purposes, be approved. All right, Ms. Gautier, would you please uh, read out the title of the items that will be subject to this vote? Through the chair, the following items will be subject to the vote. Item 6.1.1, access soil management regulation update. Item 6.1.3, joint use agreement with the Grand Neary District School Board and update regarding negotiations with the Brand Haldeman no, uh, Norfolk District School Board. Item 6.1.4, Museum Funding Agreement with Glenhurst Art Gallery. Item 6.2.2, 2021 Municipal Cultural Plan Annual Report and the minutes of the committee of the whole March meeting. All items not separated for discussion purposes carries on a recorded vote of 10 to 0. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Vanderstelt, Sless, Marn, Natoski, Wall of Antilbor, Carpenter, McCreary, Socoli, and Mayor Davis. All right, we'll now move to item number five, which is presentation delegations. We have, I believe, three that did register uh, following our rules of procedure, but we did have one request that came in late. 
And I believe, yes, Councillor, while you have a motion to waive the rules in order to allow that delegate to present, I believe in item 7.1. So would you please state your motion? And if you have a seconder, also state that, please. Yes, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor McCreary. Uh, that motion to waive the rules at section 15.6.2D of the procedural bylaw be waived to permit a delegation past the prescribed deadline. Any discussion? Seeing none, Mr. Deputy Clerk, please take the vote. Motion to waive the rules carries with the required two thirds vote. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Vanderstelt, Sless, Marn and Toski, Wall and Tobork, Carpenter, McCreary, Socoli and Mayor Davis. All right, uh, we'll now move into now four delegations. And just a reminder to the delegates that uh, in accordance with the city's procedural bylaw, section 15.62, please ensure all your comments are direct related to the matter that's before the committee and that you're coming to speak to us this evening. So first up in relation to 6.1.2, the Elgin Street multi-use path, Matthew Vandering. Matthew, I believe you're here. If you please come forward, Matthew. So Matthew, if you, you have 10 minutes inclusive any questions. And if you would start by please uh, stating your full name. My name is Matthew Vandering. And yes, I'm here to talk about the Elgin Street path. So I'd like to read some prepared remarks, that's okay? Yeah. Go ahead. All right. So thank you city councillors and attendees for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I am here today to convey my enthusiastic support for the proposed multi-use path on Elgin Street. I am a cyclist who commutes from a residential neighborhood to an industrial sector five days a week, 12 months per year. This is a five kilometer trip, which takes about 15, 20 minutes each way. <clears throat> I cycle instead of drive for many reasons, but I would like to tell you about some of my top ones. Number one, health and fitness, which is maintained by two or more hours of pedaling per week. Uh, secondly, reduced cost of living as I have been able to reduce my family's car ownership from two vehicles to one. Thirdly, improved mental health, which stems from regularly spending time out of doors, enjoying the change of seasons, the city wildlife, and interacting with people in the neighborhood. There are some individual benefits, but these but if these are scaled up to a city population, the benefits become transformative. Cost of living goes down, public health improves, relieving the strain we see on the healthcare system. Emissions are reduced, improved social cohesion as people have the opportunity to see each other and interact with one another in a public space. Poverty can be reduced um, as the workforce sees improved mobility. Noise pollution is reduced. Greater autonomy and youth or sorry, greater autonomy and freedom for youth and those who are not licensed to drive. Decreased litter as cyclists don't discard waste onto roadsides in the manner motorists do. Protection of farmland and biodiverse spaces due to decreased urban sprawl with more compact city design. I could spend a great deal of time going over the benefits of cycling as a means of urban transport, but there remains one question. Why do so few people elect to bike throughout the city instead of drive? I often ask myself this question during my daily commute, feeling relaxed as I pedal, hearing the birds singing, enjoying light exercise, greeting neighbors who are out for a morning walk, producing no street noise, burning no fuel except the energy stored in my body. I can't help but wonder why I am alone on my bike while the city is alive with motor vehicles. But I know the answer, it is design. The city streets are designed to accommodate motor vehicles, but not bicycles. Cyclists feel out of place when biking on a sidewalk, especially when we are in conflict with pedestrians. We also feel unsafe when cycling on a road with two ton vehicles traveling alongside us at 50 kilometers per hour. My wife would love to bring our children to school by bike, but feels unsafe doing so. We have no sense of belonging. The Elgin Street multi-use path will give cyclists a sense of belonging and safety. The path will be a gesture by the city which acknowledges cycling and other forms of active transportation as a practical and viable means of transportation. 
I know the city is working towards establishing bike paths elsewhere in the city as well. Ava, Balmoral, Tollgate, and others. As a cyclist, this is very heartening. And as a Brantford resident, this gives me hope that we are slowly moving away from our car-centric approach to urban planning. I'm asking council to support the construction of the Elgin Street multi-use path, as well as other active transportation infrastructure projects throughout the city. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Though I'm, there are some questions for, and if you like, you can sit down. If that's you want to sit right here, yeah, yeah, all you right. Can sit there. Sorry, my first time doing this. No, no we want you to be comfortable. <clears throat> all right, so uh, start with Councillor Toski. Thank you, Mary, and welcome, Matthew. Thank you for coming and, and giving your opinion and thoughts on this. Uh, you say you ride every day to work and, and often throughout the, the year. Let's assume that our Algon Street bike path is done. On, on your regular ride, are you still finding gaps or are, do we still have issues with our connectivity? Because that's something we, we need to be looking yes. at, Yes, right? and to be clear, I don't actually use Elgin Street, but I feel like I represent the type of people who would use Elgin Street. I work, I work on Roy Boulevard, so okay. it's a pretty similar environment. Um, uh, and I do use a little bike path. I have a five kilometer route. I think I have about 200 meters on the multi-use path on Wayne Gretzky. So yes, <laughs> to answer your question, it is um, it's very segmented. The bike, the bike routes are very segmented in the city. And so that, that I'm assuming that's where you refer to safety <clears throat> issues. You know, you feel safe when you're on your, your bike lane and then you're kind of thrown out into the Absolutely. The wild. Okay. It is, it is. There are a few intersections where I, it is, um, yeah, it's very, I have to be very attentive. So, you yeah. know. Thank you. Thanks for yeah. coming. Next, uh, Councillor Van Chilbo. Hey, Matthew. Um, very interesting to hear you cycling to do everything that you do um, and not being going to Elga Street for work, but Roy Boulevard, I would assume you'd want Roy Boulevard to go on the list uh, at a later date, right? Uh, Roy Boulevard to be on the list. Yeah. Okay, so I was gonna ask you along the lines of Elga Street, but since you're on the other side of the Wayne Gretzky Bridge, have you tried to cross that bridge uh, lately? And if so, please tell me how you do it and what uh, I, you feel uh, like. That's a good question. I have not crossed the bridge lately. I used to cross the bridge daily. It's the only place I've been hit was, um, Sorry, guys. <sighs> yeah. But you haven't, I haven't chosen to cross the Wayne Gretzky Bridge. Is that a deliberate no, choice? It's a deliberate choice. I would I think so. To, I, I would prefer to bike over West Street. Per, okay. um, because I'm not actually crossing any other roads. So, um, yeah. All right. And uh, I would imagine if you're on Elgin Street, there is heavy industrial traffic. There's work, shift work. Do you do it like do you travel your bike early in, in like yes. when rush hour traffic? Yeah. So seven to three thirty is right. my typical shift and seven in, in that area. Exactly. Busy, yeah. yeah. Right on. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Vanderstow. There's just so many Dutch people here. Yeah, I know. I feel at home here. <laughs> yep. uh, thank you. Thank you for telling your story. Um, your passion denotes that you cycle a lot more than 2.5 kilometers a day. And it's, it's so in keeping with where, where our history is, isn't it? Right. So as one very experienced and accomplished cyclist, Myself speaking to another, I also went over the head of the two cars and I've been sideswiped once and they were painful accidents that I've gone through. I saw the pain you're talking about, but we're two able cyclists. In your opinion, your professional opinion as a professional cyclist, is there enough safe linkage for cyclists through town? taking into consideration that not everybody is as good at writing as you and I are? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, no, I, I would say, I would say not. And, um, you know, I, I think I am kind of inspired, not that I have a really strong connection with the Netherlands, but I am inspired, especially these days, you can go on YouTube and watch videos of young children commuting through their cities um, unsupervised. And uh, that would be, I mean, that's a very high bar. That to me is success. 
uh, we're not there yet. And uh, no, I would say for the average cyclist, especially someone who's not a motorist as well, it is very unsafe to, to bike in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Whoop. We have one oh, more. We have more. <laughs> Sorry. You haven't used your 10 minutes yet. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Wall. <laughs> And now I feel bad. I'm sorry. Hello. All no, right. All good. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we honestly need more people like you who come to council to speak to kind of tell us about this. So I don't mean to be like a Debbie Downer about this, but it, it, you've probably seen some of the rhetoric online. Um, people are divisive about bike lanes and uh, so much so that we've put bike lanes in our ward and now they're getting taken out because yeah. the neighborhood doesn't use them. They didn't embrace them. They don't support them. Um, so my question for you is one, I agree with you 100%. We need a way for people to have active transportation and get across the city, whether it's going to school or going to work, going to visit a Councilor friend. Well, are you getting to a question? Yep, I swear I am. You've taken it upon yourself to come here and speak to this council. Are you yourself a member of any advocacy groups or are you active with other groups of individuals like you who are passionate about this? Uh, this is a new thing for me. So there are some budding relationships, uh, but. Uh, yes and no, but nothing that's nothing that's really this is this is the most involved I've been in bicycle advocacy so far. And then my next question was going to just be along the lines of if there was a way for you as somebody who, as Councilor Vanderselt said, was a professional bike rider, if there was any information that you could provide to this council or to our staff about ways that we could make things like bike lanes safer or to encourage more people to use them, because I believe that it's if you build it, they will come. Unfortunately, they're not coming we need to get more people using active transportation. And I think people like you using it are the way to get there. So thank you. And anything you can do to help us get these. Oh, Councillor Wall, is there a question there? Are you always this awesome? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, no, not really. <laughs> All right. yeah. Great, thank you. So, so Matthew, uh, on behalf of the council, I wanna thank you very much. It's important to hear the voice for those who do want a more extensive uh, bike trail network in the community. And thank you very much. For taking the time and telling us that. Yeah, thank you for the time. Okay. Next, I'm going to ask Justin McLaughlin and I believe Brandy Billardu is with him as well from the Conestoga students speaking to the item 7.2 rent safe Brantford. So again, you've seen the process of just identify yourselves and then you have 10 minutes. Hello, councillors and mayor. My name is Justin McLaughlin, and I am a Brantford resident and Ward 4 and the senior manager of advocacy for Conestoga Students Inc., which is the official student association of Conestoga College here in Brantford. We have approximately nine to 10 campuses, depending on what ones you want to count, um, across multiple cities. And here in Brantford, we have approximately 1,100 students in total. Our advocacy efforts are guided by the pillars of accountability, affordability, equity, and sustainability which has brought me here today alongside my colleague, Brandy Billado, a current Conestoga student and Brantford resident as representatives of the students of Conestoga to voice our support for the rent safe motion. Prior to the pandemic, Conestoga was growing exponentially within Brantford and attracting both local students and those from around the world to study. As these students have made Brantford their home, they have been the subject of discriminatory landlords and deplorable housing conditions with minimal knowledge about the actions they can take to rectify their personal housing situations due to the lack of centralized trustworthy information about supports and resources they may access. The stories we hear from students about their housing conditions and their treatment by some landlords are heartbreaking. We have heard stories about landlords refusing to rent to students because of their race or gender, and even informing them that they are responsible for replacing appliances when they break. Moreover, we have heard instances of landlords notifying international students that they will be deported if they report unsafe living conditions such as boulder infestations. Could you imagine arriving in Canada to pursue a post-secondary education and being refused to rent a unit because you are not Canadian? Or being threatened that if you report a health or safety issue, you are experiencing with your rental unit that they'll have you deported? We wish we could say that these were the most absurd and shocking experiences students have shared with us, but they are some of the most common. With that being said, I'd like to invite Brandy to share her experience as a local renter here in Brantford and why the actions proposed by the Rent Safe Motion are a step in the right direction to addressing issues within the rental market locally. Thank you, Justin. Hello to the members of the Committee of the Whole. Um, as Justin said, my name is Brandy Bilodeau. I am the Indigenous Associate Vice President with CSI. I am also a local resident of Brantford and have been a tenant um, in rental housing for the last 15 years. 
As a tenant, I have previously experienced issues with my rental housing and did not know where to find support for any disputes between my landlords and I. For example, shortly after I finished high school, I began to run a private bedroom in someone's home without knowing that I would not be covered by the Residential Tenancies Act. I ended up renting a bedroom in an unfinished basement with cement walls that was damp and dark with no windows, thinking that I was protected under the RTA and not knowing where to go to find any type of information or who to contact for support. This led me to living in accommodations with less than desirable landlords and fearing for my safety with no available resources as I had no rental protections. <clears throat> in a different tenancy where I did have protections under the RTA, I was at a different phase in my life as a single mother with a one-year-old child. Unfortunately, the living conditions were poor. The property had bubbling paint and separating drywall. There were multiple leaks throughout. Water damage went unrepaired, leading to mold, and there was insect infestations. To compound the issues with the property itself, the landlord would enter the unit without providing any notice, regardless if I was home or not. I attempted to have my landlord fix the issues and inform him that he needed to provide me with notice before he enters. This led me to having to pay for the products to handle the infestation, no actions being taken on the water related issues and repeatedly having my fall ups ignored by the landlord to then be served with an eviction notice for trying to ensure I had a safe and adequate place to live. I was, again, I was left again in a situation where I was unaware of my rights and had no idea where to go, who to call or what to do. Thankfully, I did have a friend who was able to inform me of my rights when they learned of my situation. But ultimately, I chose to move to a shelter as the process for trying to learn how to have the issues rectified at that stage of my tenancy and defend myself from an eviction was intimidating and was making an already difficult and stressful situation worse. <clears throat> In both these situations, if I had a place to go to learn about my rights and responsibilities as a tenant and the available supports in the community, like the rent safe grant promotion being proposed this evening, I likely would have been able to advocate for myself or find the assistance needed to ensure my housing was safe and adequate, or even better, to have avoided these situations altogether. A centralized hub for this information from a local and trustworthy source, instead of Facebook comments or keyboard warriors, would be invaluable for not only empowering tenants to advocate for themselves, but to educate our local community before they enter a tenancy. It would also reduce the stress and ambiguity many tenants encounter when these issues arise and they are left trying to find information on their own. If this motion is passed, I would be pleased to see that the specific attention will be given to ensuring the rent safe Brantford resource is culturally appropriate and accessible for our diverse city with different cultures, values, beliefs and capabilities. I know from our experience with international students, many of them understand a roommate as someone you share a bedroom with and not a dwelling with. Those who they share a dwelling with are considered flatmates. So this is just one example of how different cultures use different terminology to refer to common areas of a tenancy. We also hope this will ensure the resource created is AODA compliant and offers translation services. Thank you for listening to how a resource like Rent Safe Brantford could have supported me in my housing experiences. And I would like to allow Justin to speak to proactive approaches to housing safety. Thank you, Brandy. Brandy's story is one of the many that are frequently echoed by students in our local community. While this Rent Safe motion is a step in the right direction to empower students in the broader rental community in Brantford, it is still a reactive approach to ensuring the safety and accountability of rental units and puts the onus on renters to act as bylaw officers to ensure their own safety. If the city of Brantford is committed to addressing the deplorable and illegal housing conditions and the rental stock locally to ensure safety for residents, a proactive approach must be taken. Therefore, we are very pleased by the inclusion in the motion that staff be directed to investigate proactive opportunities and programs that make housing safer for tenants. It is our position that a comprehensive licensing program that is revenue neutral should be strongly considered to ensure rental housing is adequate before and during occupancy. We look forward to continuing to work with councillors and staff to develop solutions that ensure tenant safety and landlord accountability while respecting the need for affordability. We thank you for your time and consideration this evening and ask that you support the motion to demonstrate commitment to tenant safety throughout our community. Great. Thank you, Justin and Brandy. And we do have several councillors who'd like to ask you some questions, starting with Councillor Tosky. Thank you. Um, some of the councillors that have been here for a while might think Justin looks a little familiar. How old were you when you first presented to council, Justin? Oh, I must have been 
10, 11? Right. So, okay, that's not my, my real question. My next, my next question is, um, these stories are horrible to hear. And it, has there been any measurement or any quantification to how many people are having the, their education stopped or negatively affected because of this issue specifically? We haven't had any students straight up tell us that they have left their education because of their housing. We have had students tell us they're homeless, they're living in shelters, they're sleeping in libraries, they're living in areas that are unsafe. They are putting 10 of them in a house that is suited for two to three bedrooms um, just to get by and ensure that they are in a community that they feel safe in. Um, in terms of quantifying that, we have thousands of students across all campuses, so, yeah. but we do hear this on a relatively weekly basis. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Martin. Thank you. Do you know if Laurier or, or Conestoga have any kind of assistance for, for tenants that would that would give them the kind of information that uh, we're talking about here? Laurier is a delegate, so I'll let them speak to themselves. Um, okay. Conestoga specifically has some supports for tenancies for international students. They do not for domestic. So they only support international students with their tenancies and it is very minimal to provide information, but they do not provide any assistance otherwise in finding and securing actual housing other than a home state program, which is outsourced to a third party company. Okay, and you talked about licensing landlords. You realize that's gonna increase the, the cost of rent. That is why we specifically mentioned the revenue neutral program so that it does respect affordability, but it puts safety first. So that we ensure that the housing that is safety, if it is, or is safe, and we look at the affordability piece, if the licensing is $50 a year, $100 a year to apply for, and that's spread out over the course of a tenancy, five to $10 a month for a safe rental unit to pay over the grand scheme versus living in conditions that may affect your mental health, your physical health, is something that we see as respecting affordability and balancing the needs of safety. Okay, and in talking about your, your situation, you described water leakage and mold. Was the apartment like that before you moved in? Uh, no. So I didn't notice the damage as bad. The water wasn't like the, around the windows wasn't peeling yet. Um, maybe he just covered that up when I first moved in, but yeah, it quickly deteriorated. Yeah, it was everywhere. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Wall, I think we have time for one more question. Yes. And a question only, please, Councillor Wall. Thank you for being here. You talked about licensing. Could you give examples perhaps specifically on what you're referencing and who's doing it, who's doing it well, and how that might be something we can implement? Yeah, there's a variety of proactive approaches. We see comprehensive licensing as one of the most accountable ones in the sense that it truly ensures that the housing when you, reach, when you get it is safe. There are a variety of comprehensive licensing programs currently in use, one in London, there's one in Hamilton, there's one in Waterloo. They're not necessarily all comprehensive, but they all have that licensing piece. And so it requires proactive inspections as well as inspections on a time period basis. So whether that be two years, five years, et cetera, it allows the landlords to make sure that their housing is safe. It ensures that tenants know that the housing is safe and meets the proper codes and applicable bylaws. The licensing can be revoked if they don't, but it also make, there also needs to be approaches that if the licensing is ever revoked, that it does not put a tenant on the street because their license is pulled. Those types of supports also need to be put in place. But there are a lot of other proactive approaches, and that's why I believe that the motion currently in the wording that has saying proactive programs and opportunities, that's one option. Montreal's introducing landlord licensing versus rental unit licensing. So there are other opportunities to look at, and that's why we hope that staff will be directed just to look at the opportunities and bring that back for potential further consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justin and Brandy. And uh, we normally we would be dealing with this towards the end of our meeting, but because you've delegated, then uh, we usually advance that. So hopefully we'll be dealing with that in the next hour or so. So we also on the same topic, same item, we have a delegation from the Wilfrid Laurier University Students Union. Well, I believe we have four students present. If you'd like to come forward, please. Your turn. So if you wouldn't mind if uh, one of you could identify uh, all of the members of your delegation, and then you'll have 10 minutes to uh, do your presentation.
My name is Nadine Samanti, and I'm here representing the Student Rights Advisory Committee from the Wilfrid Laurier Stu University of Students Union, alongside my associates, Scott Reed and Sierra Mahelko. We are here to speak to the motion for Rent Safe Brantford. The Student Rights Advisory Committee is a peer support service advising students on tenancy rights and proper leasing practices. Many of our students experience tenancy right violations. When they experience these violations, they're often sent to my team where we offer non-legal advice and support. These violations have included rodent infestations to the point where the student was no longer able to re remain in their tenancy unit, landlords regularly loitering and smoking outside of the rental unit, illegal charges and deposits, often including ag aggressive speech and behaviors demanding payment, disrespecting COVID-19 public health recommendations when entering rental units, unsanitary moving conditions, including mold, vomit, excrement, and urine, <coughs> exploitation and coercion in lease, in lease signing, and landlords providing false information on tenancy rights. One student shared a story of receiving a letter from the city informing them of lead in their water and a notice of necessary service, which was completely ignored uh, despite student requests for repair. Another student was harassed by their landlord to the point of police involvement. These are but a few ways that students have experienced rights violations living in the city of Brantford. Imagine your child or loved one moving away from home for the first time, signing their first lease, sometimes as young as 17, and living in these environments. They face the option of either living in these conditions, becoming homeless, or sacrificing their education, professional, de professional development, and university experience to come home. You could live hours away, sometimes across the world, as is the case for many of our international students, and there is nothing that you can do. Your child is then directed to my team. Although we are a team of dedicated volunteers, that is exactly what we are. We are a group of students without adequate resources to share with those in need of help and are often ill-equipped to deal with the severity of the cases we receive. There are not ample resources for us to refer students towards, leaving a gap in the fulfillment of rights and basic needs. Our initial response when we receive cases is to provide information and support towards proper communication with landlords. Should those landlords be unreceptive to that communication, we are outside of our jurisdiction as a non-legal service and no longer have the capacity to help. This means that we require robust resources to refer students towards when they are in greater need of assistance beyond our peer support. Rent Safe Brantford is an opportunity for students to be able to find the help that they need and for my team to be able to have the ability to ensure our students have safe living conditions and enjoy the respect they deserve as tenants. Rent Safe Brantford would also be able to put the minds of parents, caretakers, and loved ones at ease, knowing that the people they care about have their rights protected and are able to safely advocate for them. Rent Safe Brantford shows students that their loved ones, at, so, sorry, Rent Safe Brantford shows students and their loved ones that the city of Brantford cares for them and cares that they are respected as citizens and tenants. This would continue to strengthen the sense of community in Brantford thus increasing civic engagement and contributing to an interactive and lively social dynamic. When students and their families feel safe in their rental homes, students are encouraged and enabled to actively participate in their community and increase social capital. Rent Safe Brantford would also support landlords. This project would promote the fulfillment of rights in the Residential Tenancies Act, showing landlords the rules and giving them effective resources to be able to implement and up uphold the standards set out for them including using the standard form of lease. Having this resource available for landlords would enable them to offer leasing in a legal form and allow them to be better equipped in regards to fulfilling student needs. By supporting landlords, you effectively support students. Ultimately, the Rent Safe Brantford Act would be an effective step in addressing any tenancy failures that may otherwise go unaddressed within the community. By providing an open and informative resource that is accessible by any interested party, we can provide a forum in which to address these problems to ensure that our community remains a safe and equitable environment for tenants and landlords alike. Due to the ability of Rent Safe Brantford to begin to address some of our concerns, our team is in full support of this motion and ask that you all vote in favor of passing it. We are eager to continue to work with the City of Brantford on ways to proactively and reactively support tenants when their rights are violated. And we thank you for sharing your time with us today. We would now like to open the floor to questions. 
President Dean, I see you have a fourth member of your delegation that came up while you were speaking, if you might introduce her. Uh, yes, this is our Associate Vice President of University Affairs, Shailen Harris. All right. All right, we do have some counselors like to ask some questions, starting with Councillor Vandersell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Welcome all. Um, I wanted to ask just this question. I'll ask you. Uh, I'm not going to staple you down to this, but if you could give me a percentage, just a rough estimate of a percentage of students who have um, unfortunate experiences from from your perspective and what you've been hearing, can you can you give me a percentage? So we worked earlier this year with some scholars from various universities who study student homelessness. And we discovered the statistic that, was it 7%, I believe? I believe approximately 7% of students across the nation experience homelessness at some time in their post-secondary degree. Um, we can't state whether or not this statistic is specific to Laurier or Conestoga. However, it is kind of a consistency throughout the country. But in this process, you've been fielding some complaints from a number of students, correct? Yes. And any number, any idea how many, what, what number that is? I can't give a direct number. However, I can say that I know very few people who will tell you that when they were living in student housing in the city of Brantford, their tenancy rights were respected the entire time. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next, Councillor Wall. Thanks for being here and for your hard work working together on this. Uh, my question is, my intent moving this motion is to not have this be a static thing that's created. Um, I was going to ask the last delegate this, so I hope they're listening as well. Is there a commitment from Laurier and the Students Union that you guys would continue to work with on this so that this doesn't become something that just becomes stagnant, but that continues to grow and evolve? Absolutely. Our Students Union comes with a full team of fully equipped, dedicated volunteers. Um, and paid staff, I firmly believe that throughout the time that this motion exists and throughout the time that this program exists, you will have living and active support from the Laurier Students Union. My final question. Um, do you believe that there is just an, too, met, too much not being reported at all to anybody? Absolutely. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had conversations with peers, students, friends, where they tell me these like absolutely atrocious stories about their tenancy. And I'll tell them like, send us an email, send it to this email address, we will work with you on this. And they decide not to for whatever reason. Sometimes it's because they don't feel like there's gonna be any impact from it. Sometimes they feel like it's because their landlord's not actually going to care should we help them in any way. Um, sometimes they feel like it's not safe for them to advocate for their own rights. Uh, they might fear eviction, they might fear um, with international students, as Justin stated in his delegation, they might fear deportation. There are lots of different things that students can fear, and it's not always feeling safe for students to report. Thank you for sharing. Councillor Martin, you're next. Thank you. You indicated that you've, you've helped uh, students who are having problems, and it gets to a point where you're no longer able to help. Do you refer them to the tenant tribunal at that point and help them with the paperwork for that? We do advise them that that is a step that they can take. However, we do also have to advise them that they need to seek further legal support should they take that course of action. Because um, as, although we are willing to be the best peer support system that we can, we're not able to be their legal support. Great. But you can help them with the paperwork to get something started. We are not no. able to do that. No? no. Okay. And a lot of post-secondary institutions have housing registries where you have a list of, of uh, units that are university approved. Does Laurier have something like that for Brantford? I'll let Shailen speak to that one. <laughs> um, no, uh, basically our school just uh, refers students for places for students. If any of you have seen that, that's like the main hub. So that's technically has some levels of third party verification, but Laurie does not specifically approve it on the responsible side. Okay. And uh, do you have enough residents for all first year students? Yes. Residence is guaranteed for first year students if they wish to do so. And then upper year students, there's a very limited amount of spots of students to live there. So there isn't enough for anywhere beyond first year. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, going to the uh, Zoom participants, Councillor Slavs. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just through you to the, the delegation, 
Um, it, it sounds like a sorry uh, state of affairs, but is this typical across uh, all communities that you have uh, campuses in, or, or is this unique to Brantford, or is Brantford the extreme in, in one way or the other? In collaborating with our Waterloo team on our Waterloo campus, they do see um, somewhat similar situations with uh, un or inadequate tenancy rights. It is kind of a thread or a theme that students do not experience sufficient tenancy rights. However, I have noticed that some Brantford tenancy has been exceptional in uh, degradation of student rights. Okay, so we have a, I guess everybody has a problem. Ours here happens to be more acute. W would that be fair to, to assume? From my observation, working directly with the students, I would say yes. Um, I'm not tending to hear stories such as this from students. Uh, peers and friends attending other campuses. However, student housing is a concern kind of regardless of the city. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Well, we've just gone slightly beyond the 10 minutes. So I want to thank you very much to the Wilfrid Laurier Students Association for <clears throat> delegating tonight. And again, we'll be dealing with this fairly shortly. So stay tuned and you've please feel free to stay to watch the debate that happens on that. Thank you. So I'll move now to our fourth delegate who we added through the motion to waive the rules. Uh, Elizabeth Goss, I believe you're, there you are. And you'd like to speak to the item 7.1, the Cross from School Guard. So if you would please identify yourself and then proceed with your presentation. Okay, so um, in September of 2021, my son started attending Princess Elizabeth Public School in Ward 5. Um, and we had asked about why there wasn't a crossing guard at his school and we couldn't really get anywhere in September or October, um, despite the efforts from another parent and um, our principal. On November 5th, I sent an email regarding safety concerns um, since there were no crossing guards to my city councillors and um, about the dangerous situation that I observed that there were several cars that ran through the stop sign at the corner of Murray Avenue and Tecumseh. Um, even though there had been safety patrols um, trained at the corner and it took myself and another parent being very loud and visible for cars to start stopping at the stop sign. Um, so I sent an email and it's been very difficult to figure out how to get a crossing guard at this elementary school where there's over 200 children who walk or get dropped off by their parents every single day. There are um, 25 public schools in the city of Brantford that, and out of them, three of them don't have a crossing guard. Princess Elizabeth is one of them. And another one, Onondaga Brant, um, the staff said they don't need it because they all get bussed in. So um, I had tried to email a bunch of people and anybody I could figure out to contact to try to get a crossing guard at the school. Because um, again, 200 children walk every day or get dropped off. And even though there are youth who are trained as safety patrollers, it's not enough. Um, we have letters of support from the principal, um, our MPP, uh, our Eagle Place Community Association, as well as the school board trustees. Um, they had tried to advocate for several years, or it's been a concern in that corner of Tecumseh and Marie Avenue for several years that cars fail to stop um, or completely stop at that stop sign. And um, sometimes the community members don't always respect the children who are the safety patrollers. And sometimes those students, they are youth, they're young children, um, don't always know when it's safe to let somebody continue to walk across the street. Um, and the corner to come see Emory are really concerning because that's where the kindergarten pen is. So um, there's, that's where the entrance is for most of the younger elementary students. Um, and even though like many parents vocally at the school are always complaining, why isn't there a crossing guard? Um, that's when I started to write and try to figure out how to get um, a crossing guard at the school, which is a very complex <laughs> It wasn't very clear on how to do this, so I'm really glad that I worked with my city councillors um, to bring this to your attention so that we can get a crossing guard at the school. Pretty simple, I guess. 
<laughs> well, there's going to be some questions for you. Okay, that's uh, fine. Uh, first of all, Councillor Vanderstelt. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you for advocating for their safety. That's wonderful. Um, so you, you did say 200 children that are walking to that school. Walking or get dropped off. Walking or get dropped off. So of the 200, uh, how many really do have to have a crossing guard there for their safety, roughly? Not all of them cross the street, I assume. So, um, Well, there's three points where people cross, right? Mm -hmm. But yep. I'm talking about that specific corner. Um, I don't know. It's a very crowded corner. I have not sat there and counted. Most, some? At, at least half. Half. Okay. 100 kids. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Wall. Thanks for being here. I'm glad we could figure it out. Yes. Um, okay. I know this might sound like redundant or whatever, but could you just share with us how you figured out there wasn't a crossing guard there in the first place? Like, what was the situation like? You're walking your kid to school and. Yeah, walking Jack to school. And I'm like, there's no crossing guard at the school and children were having a hard time knowing like when to cross because sometimes they're not walking with a parent. Um, when I drove Jack, like I would roll down my window and be like, you can cross. I won't run you over. Like all that kind of stuff. Um, and then I went to the first student council meeting um, or parent council meeting. And at least um, the principal, Ali Cole, was able to get safety patrollers to do something because she couldn't get a crossing guard. And it wasn't very clear to why there wasn't a crossing guard. And we only noticed that because Jack went to a daycare at Bellevue and there are several crossing guards at the other schools on the other side of Erie Avenue. So that's when we were like, oh, why is there no crossing guard here? We didn't really understand why, even though we see to, there's a need because several cars don't stop. Um, it's not safe. Kids aren't unsure about like when to cross. So that's sort of when we figured out that there's a need for it. So you've seen how complicated and convoluted the process is to get a crossing guard. So um, complicated. Could you maybe tell us on how you would have liked it to have been? Um, I emailed some people who have the ability to say, hey, there's no crossing guard. There's a need. There's a whole bunch of people who have advocated, including the principal and other parents have voiced concerns. And you put in a crossing guard. <laughs> Instead, it's this process of like emailing over a dozen people and nobody really knew how to get a crossing guard or what that process was. Um, and every time I tell a story to anybody about not having a crossing guard at the school, they're like, well, how hard is that process to get one? I'm like, I'm still very unclear. So here we are today. And thank you for being here. Well, this, the buck stops here. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Martin. You said you had support from school trustees. Yes. Did you approach them about covering the cost of the crossing guard? Um, no. Because okay. uh, by our system, it's it's not warranted to put a crossing guard there. But if if the school really wants one, then perhaps the school can uh, pony up some cash and and cover the cost. We'd be happy to include it as part of our system. But <laughs> Councillor Martin, you have a question there. Yeah. Um. Will you uh, check with your school trustees to see if they'll cover the cost? I can send another email <laughs> along with this chain if you would like to see. I'd be happy to forward it to you. Um, so you have asked the trustees to cover the cost? Not the cost. Okay. Nope, because I was told it's the Brantford police that pay for the crossing guards. So why, my question then would be like, they might come back and say, okay, so you want us to pay for a crossing guard at this school, why not all the other schools? That'd be great if they paid for all of them, yeah. <laughs> I just need someone it's... to give me a crossing guard at my son's school so no one gets hurt. I don't care who pays. I really don't. Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, uh, Liz, thanks very much. And uh, I agree with you, it is a convoluted process that could be a little bit simpler. Uh, but anyway, we'll deal with this um, again, likely in the first half of the meeting. So right. if you'd like to stay, please do so. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right, so we'll now move to item six, which is the items for consideration consent that uh, were separated. Councillor Vanderstill, I believe you have the motion on that. Would you please put it on the floor, state it, and state your seconder, please. Mr. Mayor, that all items for consideration consent 6.1 and 6.2 separate 
separated for discussion purposes be approved. All right. So we'll move then to, uh, we'll deal first with 6.1.2, which is the Elgin Street multi-use path, because of course we did have a delegation. So floor is open for discussion. Councillor Antosky. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I was really impressed by Matthew's uh, delegation because it wasn't just simply about the infrastructure of a path. It, there was a bigger picture there and it was all about quality of life and and uh, creating something better for our citizens. Um, and he also recognizes the, the challenges that we're facing. This is a this is a change and people don't tend to like change. And so um, we are looking at new design and I, really it's a bite at a time. And, and we think that Elgin Street is a really good candidate here. And we've had some really good feedback from, from the neighborhood, people trying to even just walk, not, not just uh, cyclists. So thank you for coming. I hope that we'll get support for this. I know that in our wards, many of us have struggled with, with implementing the bike lanes. And I think that this is one that, that we can comfortably uh, move forward, watch how it works. Hopefully, if we build it, they will come and uh, we can start um, making better use of that design and pushing it out um, through specifically through the newer neighborhoods as they get built. That'll be much easier, right, than doing the retrofits. But we will slowly start changing um, what that looks like and be more inviting to, to active transportation. That's it. Thank you. Councilor Martin. Thank you. I, I have no problem supporting this. The, usually the reason why people oppose bike lanes is because we're taking away driving lanes for cars and uh, or, or taking away parking. And, and a lot of residents don't, don't like that idea. Um, but it is important to fill in some of the gaps in our cycling infrastructure. So because this is, is off-road, uh, it's much safer for cyclists. And there won't be the opposition to it because we're not taking away driving lanes. And uh, a lot of times the bike lanes on, on street is part of a process called a road diet. And it's not entirely to make it safer for the cyclists. The idea is to reduce the number of lanes and try and slow traffic down as well. So a lot of times it's a two pronged approach. Uh, this one, because it's off road it doesn't uh, have that traffic calming effect, but it does provide a safe area for cyclists where they're not riding next to cars. Thank you. Councillor Van Tilburg. Yeah, this is a, a multi-use path that I think is going to be uh, well accepted when it's implemented. And I, I wish we could have a multi-lane path along all of Elgin Street. Because I do not suspect, because my Councillor uh, Martin did mention uh, something along the lines of a road diet. We had a, a road diet on the far end of Elgin Street where we also had industrial capacity and that that has created a conflict and a, a very difficult one that we had to solve. The multi-use paths are, are what I think I'd like to see us advocate as much as possible in as many places as possible. I think it is the best and safest way to allow for transportation and along that transportation still happens along our corridors. So um, quick question for staff, what is the chance of this multi-lane path, potential for causing conflict with large tractor trailers that may have to back into industrial buildings in the industrial zone. What might be different in that area as opposed to say the far um, west end of Elgin Street? Through you, Mr. Chair, David Ferguson, Manager of Traffic Services. Um, there will be that issue, obviously, if, if vehicles are backing in across the, um, the multi-use path. However, if a heavy vehicle is backing in, they do require a flag person to monitor the location. Thank you. Councilor Carpenter, you're next. Thank you. Um, and, and to the viewing public, uh, those of us that are home on Zoom, uh, we, we speak last. That's how the process works. So it's not that we don't uh, care. We don't, some that can't get into that 10 minute wire because we don't get to speak first. But speaking to this item, I appreciate coming forward 
the individual that you rides his bike, I uh, appreciate him coming forward. Good, good for you. Uh, this is going to be uh, um, an off, uh, off the road multi-use path. It's going to make it the reason it's going to be safer for uh, industrial traffic to done because it's not on the road. It's not part of the road. It's separate completely from the road. And this will be an off road path that will be very successful. It will sort of link Garden Ave to Wayne Gretzky Parkway and open up that corridor. As they, as many of you know. Garden Ave is becoming very much a residential neighborhood that is connected to Gretzky through this industrial zone. So Councilor Tusk and I are very happy to support this and bring this forward. And thank you for the staff for supporting it. Yeah, I have a question for staff. Um, this will be a multi-use path. How do you how are you going to deal with um, the issue between cyclists and pedestrians, how is that going to be managed? Uh, Catherine Broadbelt, Transportation Planning Project Coordinator. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Multi-use paths are one of those things that are generally made wide enough that both cyclists and pedestrians can use them at the same time. So it's much wider than a typical sidewalk of 1.8 meters. The multi-use path will actually be 3.5 meters. So at just the start of the intersections, including share the path signs between cyclists and pedestrians, just to alert that it is for both cyclists and pedestrians. Um, and then the width being able to accommodate both. Great. Yeah, I'm, I'm also very pleased that uh, Matthew attended tonight and uh, presented that viewpoint. I think it's important we hear that. We've been hearing a lot of opposition to bike lanes. And in my view is when you're planning, especially the construction of a new roadway or parts, or you're rebuilding a roadway, you should plan not from where you have been, but where you're going as a community. And it's pretty clear to me that with the, the popularity of e-bikes, I'm not talking about scooters now, I'm talking about bicycles that have a e-boost e to them. And and the cost of gasoline and the cost of private transportation, vehicular transportation, ever increasing exponentially. And also I think the, it's fair to say it's a generational issue as well. I think uh, younger people uh, are more open to commuting, using their bicycles, e-bikes, whatever to commute. And that's just gonna gain more in popularity. And I know some say, well, yeah, but they won't use it in the winter. Well, frankly, I have a daughter that lives in Whitehorse, Yukon, and it's pretty cold up there. And it's it's amazing the number of um, adults that actually commute to work on a bike in the far north. Now, mind you, it's, the key there is they do have a system of separate bike paths that are plowed in the winter. So I think this is a, a great step forward to demonstrate what we can do as we move forward in the planning of our roadway system. And again, Matthew, thank you very much for coming out this evening and telling us that perspective. Councillor. Well, did you have your hand up? You're next. We have control over our own mics now. I forgot. Thank you. Okay. Hello. I love what Mayor Davis just said about planning where we're going to be and not talking about where we are because a way that we're going to move forward to be more um, environmentally friendly is by providing active transportation methods across the community. And I'm 100% in support of that. It's getting people to use it because cars are convenient and uh, carpooling apparently is not convenient because not everybody wants to share a car with somebody who smokes or uh, stares at their phone the entire time they're driving. But I digress. My question is for staff, we seem to have a committee for almost everything. Do we have an active transportation committee? We do. Okay, <laughs> I see heads coming from the, <laughs> amazing. Um, how often have they not been meeting because of COVID then? Or how often do they meet? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes, there is a, an active transportation subcommittee of the Vision Zero Road Safety Committee. Um, actually, we had a meeting with clerks today, actually, to just uh, discuss that uh, committee and how to move it forward. Um, in the past, they have been meeting uh, every two months. However, uh, obviously with COVID, uh, they weren't meeting as regularly. Uh, so they've just started back up uh, about uh, a month ago. Excellent. So what I heard there was we have an active transportation subcommittee, which is a committee through the Vision Zero Safety Committee. Do you think that there is 
a need or want from the membership or even a need or want for the community that it itself is its own committee committed to moving forward on active transportation options in our community? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so active transportation is identified in our Vision Zero Action Plan. So that is the right place for it to be. Okay. Thank you. Councilor Vanderstel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Your your Yukon comments uh, caught my attention. Well, I, through you too, I don't really know. Maybe Mark. Um, we will be adding the snow clearing to uh, what we do every winter uh, um, to this path as well to ensure that it's not just, you know, eight months of the year that people get to work there or bike there, right? Through the chair, uh, Mark Jacklin, Director of Operational Services, that's correct. It will be part of the winter operations clearing. Okay, and a follow-up to that. Um, I, I know it's self-reporting. I'm asking you to self-report, but how are we doing? Are, are people able to make these, these, uh, these treks down these paths on a regular basis? Do we have any issues or are there any complaints? Could we do a better job? Are we doing a good enough job? Where are we? Through the chair, is that you regarding to clearing and during the winter? Yes, that's correct. Sorry, I should have specified. Yeah, through the chair, um, obviously, you know, our first priority is to get uh, the roads cleared and then we work our ways through uh, uh, the downtown sidewalks and the uh, paths. Um, obviously, you know, there's the odd concern here and there when somebody's trying to get to work uh, during a snowstorm. Uh, but besides that, we do our best to get them cleared and uh, we do get a lot of uh, praise for that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, not seeing any more speakers. Oh, Councilor Van Tilburg for second time. Second time. Am I on? You are. Oh, good. Um, you know, we talk about uh, whether people will use it or not. And here, here's what I recall. There was a time I worked on Elgin Street and uh, I lived over at Norman Street, uh, Norman and King George Road. And I would make that drive and you'd have to cross uh, Wayne Gretzky Parkway. And there was no multi-use trail that it was really, it was really bad. And you'd be on the main roads and those roads were fast and the cars were a lot closer back then, even, even back in that time. And putting that bridge across probably made a lot of people feel a lot more safe. And yet I remember that hairy moment crossing the bridge. And then I would go down Elgin Street. Elgin Street, rush hour time, heavy traffic, and you're trying to navigate your bicycle to get to work. And it's a very uncomfortable feeling. I mean, there's just no other way to, to put it. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to this multi-use trail. The the uh, question I have, connectivity, because people will ask, what's the timeline on the multi-use part going over the bridge on Wayne Gretzky to be reopened? Through the chair, if, if I recall correctly, it is actually open right now. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, we are. <laughs> yeah, I think that was, uh, Mark, wasn't that just repaired several weeks ago? The public works crew got right on it as soon as the weather allowed for that repair work to be done. Yeah, my apologies. Yes, that's correct. Uh, it was repaired last week. As soon as the uh, winter broke, we, we were able to get to it. Yes, I was very pleased to see that. All right. So don't see, I'm not seeing any other speakers. So Mr. Deputy Clerk, let's have the vote. Item 6.1.2, Elgin Street Multi-Use Path, cares unanimously on recorded vote of 10 to 0. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Vanderstelt, Sless, Marn, and Toski, Wall, and Tilburg, Carpenter, McCurry, Socoli, and Mayor Davis. Thank you, Chris. So uh, unless anybody has any objections, I'll... We'll move up item 7.1, that rent safe Brantford resolution and the crossing guard request as well. Uh, so not seeing any 
objections to us following that procedure. So we'll move then to 7.2 Rent Safe Brantford and Councillor Wall. That's going to require a separate resolution from the one that's uh, on the floor. So if you please state your resolution. Please read it with your seconder. Yeah, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor McCrary. Rent Safe Brantford. Whereas everyone deserves to have safe, secure, and appropriate housing that meets or exceeds property standards and building code act requirements, among others. And whereas even one is too many if living in deplorable housing conditions without necessary utilities such as adequate heat, hydro, water, or are subject to unhealthy housing conditions such as mold, pest infestations, and are subject to unsafe housing conditions where necessary repairs are not addressed promptly and are having non-functioning broken safety systems such as fire alarms, locks, windows and doors, and or illegal living conditions and or violations of building code. And whereas even one is too many if landlords are not providing essential housing services and repairs as legislated, leading to derelict rental housing, either through ignorance or neglect, and whereas even one is too many when renters do not know their rights as tenants or do not know where to turn for information and assistance and or are afraid to address poor housing conditions with their landlords. And whereas information regarding tenants' rights and responsibilities, property standards, legal supports, protected rental agreements, the landlord tenant or Tribunals Ontario and other essential resources are not located in a centralized location that is accessible for renters to access. Now, therefore, be it resolved that staff be directed to create an accessible and culturally appropriate Rent Safe Brantford webpage on the City of Brantford website that provides a centralized information hub for renters with links to relevant services and contact information by quarter three, 2022. And B, that the Rent Safe Brantford webpage be created after staff consultations with related service agencies included, including students unions, the Brantford Regional Real Estate Association, neighborhood associations, shelter providers, housing resource center, community legal services, and other interested parties. And C, that staff be directed to prepare and implement a communication strategy to promote Rent Safe Brantford. And D, that staff be directed to investigate and report back on proactive opportunities and programs that help make rental housing safer for tenants. Thank you. I'm going to try not to get emotional because this one shakes me to my core. Uh, last December, I got a call from a woman in our community whose landlord had shut off her heat and water and services. So that ch crying child was in the back round. Of, and thank God for our staff for being there for me to call and to get somebody out there from the health unit to take temperature of the property, to get space heaters installed, to get that person out of that cold place with that child into housing and give them access to resources that they needed so that they could not have that happen. That is one, one story that I have had as a counselor for Ward 5, which has tens of thousands of people who currently live in rental situations. And do all of them live in deplorable situations? Absolutely not. But if one person does, it's too many. Any. Black mold, not proper access, discrimination because of their sexual orientation or their race or where they're from or who they are or for whatever reason. Like, we get all these calls and we try to connect them to resources, but it's so fragmented. There's no shortage of people who want to help. They're just not all in one consolidated place. And the entire intent of this motion is to make access to information more accessible. I know that our staff are capable of doing it. I know that the member agencies out there are capable of doing it. But ultimately, when you're somebody who has to choose between being homeless and renting an unsafe apartment, too many will take the unsafe apartment. Too many of these cases are being unreported in our community. People go over to somebody's house and be like, you know, your house is an illegal apartment. Or the story that we heard about somebody renting in a room in a house, and they're not even protected by the rights that are supposed to protect people. Our city, in its priority, in its mission statement, we say that we are going to take the safety of our citizens of paramount importance. That's not a direct quote. But at the end of the day, all I'm asking for is our staff to work together with the Real Estate Association, who know property, to work with the Chamber of Commerce, to work with the Students Union, to work with the tenant advocacy groups, to work with the legal aid clinic, to work with the shelters, and to build a resource. So the delegates said it themselves, trustworthy information. 
go on to social media, go to Ask Anything in Brantford, go to one of the buy and sell groups, and you will see hundreds of horror stories of people in our community who are subject to unsafe living conditions. And then keyboard warriors was a term that was tossed around, but people throw all sorts of nonsense out there about what people's rights are, what people can do, what people can't do. It becomes an argument. We need a trustworthy place so that if you or someone you know is facing unsafe living conditions or is facing discrimination from landlords or is facing anything to do with Tennessee in our, Tennessee, Tennessee in our community, sorry, they could go. And I think a one-stop shop page, that is what we're calling a living website that continues to evolve and grow as our users use it, is a no-brainer. I want to sincerely thank the, both the student unions for coming to speak today. I want to thank them for helping me work on this. I want to thank your commitment. And honest, I just want to thank our staff because it's, it's too frequent that my phone or my inbox lights up with a request for help from a constituent that I am supposed to serve. And they have been there doing the job to help. This isn't for lack of staff doing it. This is intended to just raise awareness that no one in our community should have to live in a place that isn't safe. So I'm sorry I got all yelly, but this is really important to me and it's very important to our community. And thank you. Councilor Wall, that wasn't yelly, that was just passionate. So. Councillor Antoski, you're next. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I have what I hope will be a friendly amendment. Um, what, what I heard tonight is this is not just a Brantford problem. This is, we've got national stats and um, I, I'm hoping that we can amend to share this uh, with FCM and our MP and I'll, I'll look to our rep for AMO to see if we should be including AMO in our MPP as well. Yeah, I'm seeing a nodding of the heads, the mover and the seconder. Is that whatever, is that kind of whatever? Whatever, okay. So it's friendly. All right. So, Councillor Antoski, did you want to finish your comments? Um, that this resolution be shared with our MP, our MPP, FCM, and AMO. Okay, next speaker's list, Councillor Martin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. While we're on the vein of friendly amendments, I'd like to add one. The uh, Brant Landlords Association needs to be included in the list of, of uh, people that are being consulted for this. So I'm hoping that'll be friendly as well. I'm seeing a thumbs up from the mover. I didn't see a reaction from the seconder. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, that's fine now we could actually see it thank you can't, can't see the, i can't see a little flick of the wrist so all right that's uh, that's friendly go ahead council Mark. great thank you um a question through the staff do we have any idea what this is going to cost us in the way of staff time and, and resources so Marlene Miranda, Community um, Services and Social Development, General Manager. Um, just um, to let everyone know that there currently are two uh, web pages already, um, one through the city and our housing site uh, through the city, and the other one through the Housing uh, Resource Centre, which is also contracted through the city and has the administrative role for the web page. Um, so there is an opportunity uh, to do the refresh enhancement, ensuring um, direct links uh, for ease of access with continued engagement as per the NOM and um, internal um, departments as well. So um, just to note from eight, the um, parts of the NOM A to C would require a minimum of 20 or 30 hours across multiple city departments. Um, basically, we would be looking at updating and refreshing the sites. Uh, we would be reviewing and adding content and ensuring its accuracy. Um, we would be doing consultation and engagement with the respective parties, uh, which we regularly engage with. Um, and then we'd have to be creating a community strategy. Um, and uh, we recognize that there are several departments already that are at or above capacity, um, but that would be um, A through C. When we um, speak to D, um, this would uh, require a broader and more complex um, ask. And if it is the desire of committee and council, it will require us to uh, scope out the project and resource it. Ideally, through the 2023 20, uh, estimates, as currently there's not it's not within uh, the work plans and budgets for housing or internal um, departments. 
Uh, because at a minim minimum, that investigative process would require at least a jurisdictional review options, um, programs uh, with costings would need to be would need to be considered uh, to bring forward uh, for council uh, consideration. So just to re uh, re um, repeat, uh, just 20 to 30 hours minimum for A through C and a more comprehensive project um, asked uh, for um, the NOM D, the section D of the NOM. Okay. So essentially this whole thing is a duplication of services that are already available. Did I hear that correctly? So there are uh, web pages that are already in existence. Um, so yes, it is um, a duplication. There is an opportunity, as I said, for a refresh and enhancement and further engagement uh, with the parties and partners. Okay, thank you very much. Um, with that in mind, I'll, I'll be voting against this. Uh, if, if there is a, a need for Section D, that's something that should come to estimates. It's not something we should be doing midterm. Um, uh, so I hope uh, council will see the wisdom in, in not passing this tonight and having this whole thing be referred to, to estimates possibly at the next uh, next go around. Um, and it's, it's always important to remember there's two sides to every story. Stories of 10 students living in, in a two bedroom apartment, the landlord probably rented to two people. So it's, it's to uh, to say that, that that it's always the landlord that that's at fault, I think is is a bit of a stretch. I know as the landlord, I've been accused of being racist, and uh, that certainly wasn't the case. I can assure you that. So I'll be voting against this. Thank you. All right, uh, Councillor Vanderstoep, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councillor Martin brings up a good point in terms of uh, Section D. So let's say the information is refurbished and out there again for student population. They find out the, the real, like the valid uh, information about what is safe and what is unsafe in their own education process. The next logical step that a student would take is to check whether or not there is a system by which we manage those unsafe environments. So that would be, I, I would argue, um, Property Standards Department, City of Brantford, uh, Building Department, um, Fire Department, um so do do we not have like an all like a legal obligation if we're going to post it again on another uh front-facing website the the information about safe living circumstances I, I believe we already have those systems in place to address the deficiencies in housing so are, are we obligated within our own internal structures to take every complaint that comes in and manage it with the structures that we already have in place? Is that where we're headed with this, Marlene? Uh, so through the chair to council, um, I can't speak for the property standards and the licensing pieces of it. So um, through housing, uh, whatever's available, we will address and work with um, the tenants uh, to assist them to find uh, safe living arrangements and to work with them. Um, um, but to speak to the bylaw and the property standards and the enforcement, um, I would have to ask my colleagues to comment on that. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, I heard the number, I guess I can share the number. Uh, 60 to 70% of the students that uh, were, were uh, advocated for uh, tonight in one of the presentations have been logging complaints about their living situations. That, that is a stunning number. Um, I have firsthand experience of those types of complaints in my own life. I, I won't um, elaborate on that. Bottom line is, if it's a number of 15 to 20%, um, it's, uh, it's unfortunate to be at 20%. But when the reports are coming back 60 to 70%, where there's smoke, there's fire. Where th I think there's a problem here. I think there's a definite um, uh, a demonstrated problem um based on the advocates that are giving us the information so there's there's obviously holes in this service model where people do not feel safe for whatever reason or uh, uh, uh uncleanly uh, circumstances or, or or uh you know uh, poor treatment or whatever it may be um i i think this is something that bears a second look i i'm not certain of the cost but i i, I thought i would never say this mr mayor but in principle i do agree with the argument of making sure we provide the communication and the mechanism by which people repair 
these deficiencies, okay? I don't know where after the in principle argument goes away that the funding comes from, but it is paramount. It seems like we're talking about student safety tonight, whether it's kids walking to school or, or you know, slightly older kids finding accommodations. What, what is uh, frustrating for me is to realize that not only are they coming, many people are coming from overseas here for an education, they also have to be educated about the safety in Canada, which is frustrating to me and saddening to me. So I, I think in principle, I can support this, uh, bearing in mind what I've already heard, um, because something needs to be done. 60 to 70% is not, a, is not a fake number that comes from somewhere. And it shows a deficiency and we have to address it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilor McCurry, you're next. Uh, Mayor, thank you. Well, Councilor Wall has, um, has uh, done some good work here on an initiative that's long overdue in the community. Uh, we've all heard the stories of uh, how tenants are uh, uh, often disadvantaged. And of course, landlords are disadvantaged too. And Councillor Martin's absolutely correct. Um, if you're a tenant in the province of Ontario, uh, it's your right and responsibility to employ the standard Ontario lease, which is mandatory. It's the law here. Uh, if you don't have one of those, you should get one. Uh, and uh, I've heard stories, and I, I could talk about one specifically, um, a family, two-generation family in, in our ward uh, who had been harassed by their landlord for a number of years trying to get them out so he could um, enjoy a much higher rent than what they'd been paying for a number of years. Um, no written lease, uh, no proper eviction notice, um, and uh, eventually they, they just gave up and left because they didn't have the tools to do it. Um, so I think, um, I think there, you know, there's a, there's a number of things. Um, one, the one thing, of course, it's not just students, but, but some of the landlords, um, practice age marginalization and younger folks are taken advantage of because you just don't know any better. And, you know, some of them don't have the parental supports to tell them to know better. Um, and again, in this period of time in Ontario, when everything seems to be working against folks in the housing market, there are a lot of people out there that probably are just damn glad to have any place to live and aren't about to rock the boat, despite the fact that they're being taken advantage of and living in substandard conditions, because in a lot of cases, it sure beats living in the back of your Toyota or uh, under the bridge. Um, so I, I'm happy to support this. I, I, I hear the arguments about, about the expense and, of course, um, every amount of money that we deal with when it's taxpayers' money is a lot of money, uh, contrary to what our friend said at one time many years ago. Um, but I think I, I take solace in, in hearing that a lot of this work uh, has a platform already to be done in. We do have the web presence that uh, to some extent is going to be a refresh. And uh, when we come to item D, uh, we're, just in, we're just asking to have that reported back on what a potential course of action could be. And that can land on our desks in time for the 2023 budget, which isn't far off. And hopefully that'll be a zero budget. Yes, I am looking at you. Thank you. Councillor Sletz, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just a few things. Firstly, I think there has to be a partnership. It's not just, um, it's a city problem, but, but I, I, I was quite, uh, taken back but when I heard that Laurier doesn't have a, uh, a, a registry for uh, a housing registry for students to access to see where, where there's places where I, I would tend to think that the uh, potential landlords could register with the university. The university would check the, the accommodation to make sure it, it's appropriate and then they would go on a list and, and students would come in and they would say you know I'm looking for a a 10 minute walk or a 20 minute walk from campus. And, and, and these are the places that are available. So I, I think uh, that would help. Uh, I, it sounds like we do have a lot of the work done that uh, that's being requested here, but perhaps it's not uh, promoted well enough. Uh, people don't know where to look. They, they don't find it. They, they just assume there is nothing. Uh, perhaps we need to do a better job of getting it out there and letting people know that yes, there, there is a place where you can go for, for reliable and correct information. Uh, and, and it doesn't appear that that's happening currently because we're hearing all these horror stories. Uh, thirdly, I would say this isn't just a student problem. Um, 
well, it's horrible that it's happening with the students. I get calls all the time. I, I dealt with one uh, this week uh, of people that don't understand. They don't know their rights. Uh, they're getting, I guess to coin a phrase, jerked around. And I think in this housing market, I think a, a lot of uh, homeowners or rental owners are saying, you know what, instead of dealing with all the aggravation, I'm gonna cash out because I can get a fortune for my place now. And these people are dumped out onto the street and are at the mercy of, of someone else to try and find a place to live. So th there's a lot of that going on. And, and I understand why the people are dumping the real estate out They're They're, they're cashing in. They've maybe held these things for a long time and maybe it's time to retire from the uh, rental business. But by the same token, the folks living there uh, really have no no protection. Once once that house uh, starts to get sold, uh, they're very vulnerable. And so I think th there's a lot to be had here. I'm, I'm certainly going to support this. But, but I think uh, while we're reviewing and how we're going to um, refresh the information we have, I think we have to give some thought as to how we promote what we have. Because I, I, I just don't think that people are finding what they need to find uh, either easily. They're, Typically, uh, I, I would assume that, that folks that are in these vulnerable situations are probably, if they're struggling and living in a place that, that we're, we're describing tonight, they're, they're probably not uh, endowed with, with internet and all the things you need to access a lot of this information. They have to go to a library and they have to do things where they can get information uh, free if they know where to look. And, and I think we have to somehow reach out to that population and to those students and say, you know, this is where you can find everything you need to know if you're in a a problem situation in your accommodation, uh, this is where you go to get reliable and trustworthy information. So I, I think this goes a long way into getting there. So I, uh, I'll certainly be supporting this and, and I, I would hope that it would get uh, approval. It, it's, a, it's not a good thing when students are, are coming to our community and they're being treated like this. I can imagine what's being said in other communities where, where these children come from or the, these students come from. So from the student end of it, yeah, it, it doesn't bode well for the city to have this type of a reputation. And it, I think the comment was made by one of the presenters that uh, perhaps in, in that person's opinion, the problem is a little more acute in Brantford than it is elsewhere. So I think it's something that needs definitely cleaning up. But again, not just for the students, I think for the entire population. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Councilor Carpenter, you're next. Thank you. I too want to applaud the students for coming forward because they are highlighting, as Councilor Sless said, this is a problem that's community wide. I too got a call this week from a, a from a tenant who's being evicted with three days notice. Because you know, if you're renting a room, you're not covered under the Landlord and Tenants Act. You're not covered at all. In fact, we have a policy in the city of Brantford that any property owner in the city of Brantford could rent out up to four bedrooms. And they're getting, getting $750 a month for a bedroom. Uh, and that's what's going on. Uh, and then if the tenant isn't satisfactory, uh, or perfect or complains about any kind of conditions, what we find is all of a sudden that, that there's all there's another tenant waiting in the wings for that same spot. There's such a shortage of places for people to live right now because there's rental evictions. Uh, there's uh, people being bought out of their rental units so that they, the, the house house can be can be renovated and flipped. And there's people that are uh, that are homeless that uh, the seniors, uh, lots of them. And there's lots of people living in lots of one bedroom units all over the city uh, and some of them are in more than four bedrooms and in improper zoning so there's a lot that we can do and have to do and i'm happy to see that that, that this is before us because there's a lot more work here uh you know the constituent i spoke with there's not there's nothing we could do for her she her only option was was to uh, to, to file small claims there's no protection and I, when I spoke to Will Bowman's office about it, I reminded him to look into this because there's no protection for those people that are renting uh, a bedroom, one bedroom. And students are finding the same thing. There's very little protection. So uh, I, I applaud the mover for bringing this forward. It is a large problem and getting worse when the, because the vacancy rate is, is, is next to nil here. And if you are living in a half decent unit, you gotta be quiet or uh, you won't be living there. Uh, there's lots of ways to get people out and it seems to be happening. So uh, I, I've heard from lots of people in the community looking for homes and uh, those that have them are just keep quiet. So I, I would like to find a place for people to actually have find information, be able to register complaints, uh, you know, fire complaints, building complaints, health complaints, without the risk of being evicted because they raised the issue of what's happening with the unit. And uh, I think that Councillor Wall is really uh, hit on something here, and this does need a lot more work. 
it, should it be a provincial responsibility? Absolutely. Is it? No. So uh, we we have we've always had to take up the the, uh, the uh, cause where the province didn't, and sooner or later the province recognizes it and takes it up as well. So maybe we can get the uh, our, our MPP on board as well. I'm sure that we could. So uh, let's uh, let's move this forward. I think it's the right thing to do. Thank you. All right, I'll be happy to support this resolution, but I, I agree with you, Councillor Carpenter, that landlord and tenancies is a provincial responsibility. The Landlord and Tenant Act is provincial legislation. The Landlord and Tenant Tribunal is a provincial tribunal. And as we heard tonight, you can provide as much advice and information to tenants as you can through a website. And that's a good idea because tenants that are informed and landlords informed that their obligations are, um, that's a good thing. <clears throat> but you, if, if you have a situation where it can't be resolved by discussion and knowledge, then you have to go to the landlord and tenant tribunal. And for many people, that's very challenging. And so that comes down to advocacy. And we as councillors, we're not trained to do that. And that's not something you normally do. That's a provincial responsibility. So the province uh, over the last several decades, cut back on the Ontario Legal Aid Plan, cut back on the Landlord and Tenant Advisory Bureaus. This is something that we should be lobbying the provincial government to allocate more funds for them to properly exercise uh, the jurisdiction they have in providing more assistance to tenants and information advice to landlords mm -hmm. and what their rights and their responsibilities are as well. So I'm hoping that when this comes back to us uh, later this year or next year, that that'll be a component as well. So, Councillor Wall, I think you want to speak to this for a second. I believe Councillor Van Tilburg, first time speaker. Councillor Van Tilburg, sorry, but you you got to keep the hand up sustained until I see it. It gets sore hanging there. <laughs> Let's get a, we might get a green button I can push sometime in the future. Look, um, you know, People can have a happy tenancy for a very long time and have a very safe and, and good place to live. And then one day it all gets turned on their head. And, um, you know, you may never have had to look for that information. And I'll tell you, when you need to find it, you actually need to find it. There's uh, the, 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 the list here that is before me in this resolution that puts it all in one spot. I, I don't care if it's redundant or not. The more that we get that information out there, if it's copied at the universities, if it's shared amongst others in the community, that's what we need to do. We can only be an advocate for so much and for so long. We try our best. We take those calls. Um, we fight battles. Some of these battles take a long time. Um, you can be playing games between some of the activities that are going on. And there's and the problem is, is that the individuals are under stress the entire time. And so knowledge and information and things that can say, hey, you know, because I don't think there's anything I haven't heard in the, the eight years I've been here from, from eviction notices of three days. And that's not just I'm living in a house, just I'm going to be gone and you're going to be gone three days. I mean, and if people don't know any better, they don't, uh, the, the abuse that can happen, it's quite significant. There's, there's many things going on. And I'm hoping in the discussions that we can deal with some of the things and with regards to safety, because it goes beyond even the security of your own residency and tenancy. I've had landlords, and that's why I want to bring this in. We have some, I, honestly, I wish I could put the bad tenants with the bad landlords. It just doesn't happen that way. But I, but I got some really good landlords landlords out there and um they did this one year and the mayor was involved where the landlord had said i'm not going to rent my apartments to students until you can take care of the activities happening on the street and that took some time and we got there and those tenants are back students are back there but that's the kind of care that is out there in the community too and luckily with those information, we have to actually use those same battles for the activities happening across the streets because what we were witnessing was other abuses going on. And the repercussions were the students being affected by it. 
So, I mean, it is it is many things and it's a chain reaction. And, and quite frankly, you know, I think every counselor here has a story. I've got a few. I've got ongoing ones. Uh, advocacy is so important. The work of the Brandt Legal Clinic. Um, my gosh, they've been my backstop numerous times and and they've kept people in their homes. And that's the information that makes things successful by having the proper information. Proper information on how to deal with our bylaw department, what, what procedures go through. Things can't happen like that. I wish we could, I wish we could snap our fingers. But when we get into things like Councilor Walls mentioning earlier, in the middle of the winter, when we're talking about heat and a baby, I remember when he was getting those emails. That's significant, those things here, we can act on right away. The more that people have the information, the more advocacy you're going to have, the more this is spread. So I would like to see this in a, in a one, I would quite frankly, I would use it myself. That's how I value the tool that we can create. Thank you. Councillor Wells, second speech. Okay. Thank you. And I'm thankful for the second opportunity to speak. Um, I won't yell. I'm going to articulate just a little bit better. So I want to say thank you again to the students' unions from Conestoga and Laurier for being here. And I feel like it's great that you are here because you are advocates for the students. We are the advocates for the people of this community. And I just want to try to break this down a little bit so that everybody kind of completely gets it. Uh, knowledge is power. And one of the greatest things that you can give to somebody else is access to knowledge. So yeah, books for every topic you could ever imagine exist. They're already existing. And to rewrite those books would be a duplication. But libraries exist. That's the place you go where you go to get all the books. I want to create a library for tenants' resources. That's it. So yeah, the city has links somewhere on our website for all the resources for tenants. I get that. And I'm appreciative that that exists. What I want to do is I want to take all those links. I want to put them into one spot so that when a tenant calls me and says, yo, my landlord cut off my heat or I have a broken staircase up to my door, I'm like, oh, go to branford.ca slash to be determined and everything you need will be there. Let me know how I can help further. So then you might ask, well, why are we here? Why are we discussing this in the big room with the fancy chairs and all the people? Because sometimes you got to take things like this and bring them to light. You have to shine a spotlight on them. You have to shine the light. I'm yelling. <laughs> sometimes you have to shine the light on topics that are uncomfortable to talk about sometimes you have to shine a light on the inadequacies in our community and it is crystal clear to me that there are too many people in our community who are living in a situation that is unsafe or unhealthy and if we don't talk about it then how are people going to know that this is something that we're working on and that we're trying to make better and how are we going to get more people to be a part of the conversation so it was never my intent to waste anyone's time here tonight. It was never my intent to duplicate work that was already done. My intent tonight was to create a resource that is desperately needed. And as one of the delegations said, it has to come from a trusted source. When you go to the city of Brantford's website to get information, you just have a sense of security in knowing that that information is valid. So let's just, I hope my council, my team, team Brantford, can support the creation of a one-stop shop directory where tenants can receive support and resources to help them with tenancy issues. And that additionally, the final section of it is that we are going to work with all the community partners to figure out a way we can make tenancy safer for everybody in our community. That shouldn't be convoluted. That should be crystal clear. And uh, I'm gonna use my time because I got two more minutes. I'm just gonna say one last thing. If you or somebody you know in our community is living in unsafe housing. Report it, call it in, call the authorities, okay? Because the only way we're gonna stop this from happening is if you report it. Thank you. Deputy Clerk, please uh, take the vote. <clears throat> Item 7.2, rent safe. Branford carries on a recorded vote of nine to one. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Vanderstelt, Sless, and Toski, Wall, and Tobor, Carpenter, McCreary, 
Socoli, Mayor Davis, members opposed, Councillor Martin. All right, we'll move to the second 7.1 item, and that's the crossing guard request, because of course we did have a delegation. Councillor Wall, this is uh, your resolution. Would you please move the resolution and state your seconder? Thank you, Mayor Davis. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor McCreary. 7.1 crossing guard request, Princess Elizabeth School. Whereas Princess Elizabeth School is located in Ward 5, and whereas due to a drop off restriction, students must cross the street to access Princess Elizabeth School. And whereas Princess Elizabeth School does not have an adult school crossing guard. And whereas concerned constituents have reached out to both Ward 5 councillors and the mayor regarding the need for an adult school crossing guard at Tecumseh Street and Marie Ave, Princess Elizabeth School. And whereas correspondence for support to add an adult school crossing guard at the intersection of Tecumseh Street and Marie Ave has been received. And whereas the Brantford Police Services Board manages the adult school crossing guard program. And whereas all requests for adult school crossing guards who evaluated through a crossing guard study conducted by the City of Brantford Public Works Commission. And whereas Tecumseh Street and Marie Ave is currently supported by student safety patrollers. And whereas city staff determined that an adult school crossing guard was not warranted for Tecumseh Street and Marie Ave. And whereas at its board meeting on November 23rd, 2021, the board the Police Services Board did not approve an adult crossing guard at the Cumsey and Marie Princess Elizabeth School. Now, therefore, be it resolved that an adult school crossing guard be approved at the intersection of Tecumsey Street and Marie Ave to address the concerns raised by area residents, parents, and school representatives to provide safe and controlled crossings for students. And B, that the city be directed to forward a copy of this resolution to the Brant. Police Services Board to reconsider the request for an additional adult school crossing guard at Tecumseh Street and Marie Ave and see that upon receipt of approval from the Brantford Police Board, Public Works be directed to install the appropriate signs and markings to implement a regulatory school crossing in coordination with Brantford Police Services. And I'm going to speak to this, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. <clears throat> it really is complicated to get a crossing guard. In fact, so much so that I just had to speak for like two and a half minutes to direct staff and to ask politely that the police services board uh, fund this. Um, I just became a dad to my darling little girl, Evelyn, and I can't imagine walking her to school one day and getting to where I would expect there to be a crossing guard and then being like, oh, I guess there's no crossing guard here and just kind of having to navigate my way across the road. Um, what if I couldn't walk my daughter to school that day and I had to send her on her own and God forbid something were to happen. And then I dive deep into it and I figure out that we're one of the only schools in the entire city that doesn't happen to have a crossing guard. It just, I get it. Staff are doing their job and they do their reports and they do their studies. And every now and then this council has to do something that staff don't recommend, like making a road a certain way or taking away parking or adding parking or putting up a street light or doing something that is not recommended by staff. I think at the end of the day, the people who are sitting up here in this area work for the people of the city, and this is their city. So if a bunch of moms and dads and aunts and uncles and grandparents from my neighborhood come to me and say, Councillor Wall, give us a crossing guard, what am I supposed to do? Say no? Like, that's not even an option. They tell me what to do. That's my job. And yeah, you could go deeper onto that and like maybe 10 people don't want a crossing guard and 20 people do. But at the end of the day, it's a crossing guard for kids for school. <laughs> and I don't think it's a lot of money. I don't think there's anybody here. Can anybody tell me how much crossing guard costs per year? A million bucks, two million bucks, two and a half million, 20 million. Through the chair per crossing guard is approximately $7,000 for uh, year? wages. Yes. 7,000. Yes. Sorry, it bears repeating $7,000. Okay, thank you, Mark. I really appreciate you having that answer for me. We need a crossing guard at $7,000, please, for the kids. Thanks. Councilor Josh. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, these are young children. This is a crossing guard. I, I think I heard there's three schools. One, Onondaga Brant has all of their kids bust in, so that doesn't make sense. I'm not sure the circumstances behind the other, but I don't... I don't know why we don't have a crossing guard for every school that has children that walk to school. Um, I, 
I think this is a no brainer. I think this is about safety. Um, and certainly this is not something that should be decided on by cost. This is safety of our children. There's an education piece to the, for the kids as well in terms of learning what to watch for and that that crossing guard helps them. I mean, sometimes crossing guards have trouble with drivers. Um, I used to be on the police services board. We heard stories of crossing guards breaking their signs, like trying to stop cars. Imagine if that was a kid, a young child, some, your neighbor. Um, they're not going to be watching for that and have the, the wherewithal to stop that car. So um, absolutely, 100%, I'm in favor of this. I, I'm not sure why we don't have it for all schools uh, that have children walking. And please do not make this an issue about cost. Thank you. Councilor Martin. Thank you. The city has procedures for a lot of things and, and, and a lot of things are done through warrant studies. And, you know, is this something that is warranted or not? And we took a look at this and decided it wasn't warranted. Now, I realize that a lot of schools have adult crossing guards, but a lot of schools are situated on arterial roads where there is heavy traffic. This is on a, a single corner where it's a dead end in one direction, nothing in one direction, and two streets coming together. It's not a high volume street. It's not a through street. I, I would suspect that most of the traffic is parents dropping off their kids. And they're the ones that should be taking extra care because their own children go to that school as well. So the fact that this wasn't warranted speaks volumes to the situation there. And if we start approving crossing guards where they're not warranted all over the city, we're gonna see a big increase in the number of crossing guards. So we have these, these warrant studies for a reason. And I think we need to pay heed to that because staff do a, a proper evaluation using a number of criteria. I don't have all of them right at my fingertips, but it is something that they looked at and they decided that it wasn't warranted at this location. So I'm gonna support the staff recommendation and vote against this because it's not a high volume street. Thank you. Councilor Van Tilburg. You know, um, when I received Elizabeth's email, if there was a chair to fall off at the time, I probably would have because it would never ever cross my mind that there wasn't a crossing guard there all this time. I naturally assumed there was a crossing guard. Probably everybody naturally assumes there's a crossing guard. You know, we go near schools, we put up stop signs to protect kids from things. We know that they're not warranted, but we do it. $7,000, quite frankly, I'm going to say it is not a lot of money to get us a crossing guard for the school. And what, what could possibly happen? My gosh, other schools could want crossing guards. What is there? Three more to go? Two more to go? One? One? Oh, so, you know, um, look, I hope this passes. I hope the police services board passes it and that we get that crossing guard. If there's a problem for money, we can make this council priorities. We can use our money from council priorities because I would expect the safety of the children in Eagle Place on Tecumseh Street as a council priority. It's certainly my priority. That's where I put my, my money. And I've seen us spend money on council priorities that quite frankly weren't priority of mine. This is certainly a benefit to the community, a benefit to those kids. It only takes one car and one mistake and if the parents are going down that way and it's kind of a, a a cluster and it is a cluster down there at that time of day because they're spinning around too they're all trying to pick up get in and get out of there and you know what that can be sometimes even more problematic because one does expect a lot of traffic on a major intersection one might not expect some of the activities of the way cars are behaving uh, down there. So again, um, Elizabeth contacted numerous people from the principals, the school boards, 
And everybody in that email thread went, yeah, of course. <laughs> the, the, the trick was, <laughs> what's the procedure for getting one? Because it's such a no-brainer, we wouldn't realize that there would be such an issue. And so um, one up for Councillor Wall and putting this one together, after going through all this, the steps, we're not done yet. This is just us saying we know there's a warrant study and we think having a crossing guard at Tecumseh and Mary, Marie Street is the right thing to do. Councillor Vanderstill. Thank you, Mayor Davis. Uh, stop signs. Dial the clock back a bit. We were receiving complaints from all over the city about speeders during COVID. It got worse. The attitude got worse. And our only mechanism to slow traffic down, apparently, was put up more stop signs. Now, normally, when you put up a stop sign, you go through what's called a warrant study. We threw that out the window as a council. We eliminated it completely, basically. And actually, we brought motions to waive the rules to bring in stop signs faster in order to stay ahead of the weather. <laughs> we wanted to be able to dig the holes through the frost because we were concerned about safety and we didn't, we weren't so concerned about the warrant studies or the, the factual matters that were coming from the recommendations from our staff with regard to where one is warranted or not warranted. So this is hardly precedent setting. We've been doing this for quite some time and I guess my concern is um, when we're talking about safety and we're trying to stop or slow traffic down or stop it more often to keep people safer, we're doing that on, on a number of different occasions throughout the city. This is just one more situation where we're trying to keep people safe. So there's a, a fixed cost to uh, every time we set up a stop sign or a four way or two way, um, but we don't have to ban it. This is quite different. This is a, uh, a, a person to intersection. Also, not to forget, this is another way to build community. If you're looking for the relationships that are built between caregivers and those who are being cared for, a crossing guard is one more set of eyes on those 200 kids that walk by twice a day. One more way of caring. I'll support this. Now to the uh, Zoom participants. Uh, Councillor Sless, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, things have changed because I, uh, in my first term of council, I, uh, I went and made delegation on behalf of uh, James Hillier School to get a crossing guard there. And, and you had to do that uh, in person and you made your case and, uh, and you got out of there hopefully with a crossing guard, which was the case in, in that instance. So I, I, when I read this, I, I, I have a little bit of a problem. I certainly support um, getting a crossing guard there. And I should make that very clear. But when I read the resolution, Clause A says we're going to approve a crossing guard. We don't have the authority to do that, my understanding. Uh, we can ask that the police services board reconsider their decision, but we can't approve crossing guards. At least someone please correct me if I'm wrong. But, but I, th that's not a jurisdiction we have. That, that's up to the police services board and not the city of Brantford. Can, can you clarify that for me, Indy, please? Sure, Councillor Sess, through you, Mayor Davis. Uh, just for clarification, uh, because staff, the reason it was written that way, um, because staff had recommended not to have one, uh, council needs to recommend the opposite, pretty much. So really the recommendation for the approval is overstepping the staff recommendation to go to the police board. It's still the, the decision of the police board, but this is just to say that the city is approving it now, which is not what staff was recommending initially. So that's why it's written that way. Okay, no, I appreciate that. So it was kind of confusing to me. Um, we're approving it, and then we're sending it to the police board asking them to approve it. So I, yes. It, it's, yes. it's a little there, bit convoluted. Uh, there's no question about that, because my interpretation was we were approving one tonight, and now we just need the money to go through with it. Um, I guess having said that, uh, I would probably direct this to uh, the CAO. Can you give me a ballpark figure of the police services budget, their overall budget? Approximately 36 or 37 million, it's in 39 million. 39 million, and in $39 million, they can't find $7,000 to, 
to put a crossing guard in. I, I find that unbelievably um, naive. I, I, I really, that's a hard sell to me, at, at least to me, and may, maybe it is to others, I don't know. But if you can't find a $7,000 expense in $39 million, um, you're not taking a real hard look at your budget. I, I'm sure there's all kinds of funding in there, not all kinds, but there's certainly a combination that, that, that could be made to, to incorporate this crossing guard. Point of order. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Stage point of order. Nobody's asked the police to do it yet. We, it's just, we, it wasn't approved. So the police were never asked to spend the $7,000. I just, I don't think Councillor Sleth means what he's saying. And I want to give him an opportunity. They didn't say no. We didn't ask them. They didn't have a chance to approve or disapprove. All right, Ted, that's not a point of order. You can you can deal with that in your secondary comments. Okay. But to continue on, please, Councillor Thank Slough. you. Uh, well, having heard that, when I looked in Clause B, uh, it says that we're affording uh, a copy of this resolution to the Police Services Board uh, to reconsider the request. So if, if we're asking them to reconsider it, they must have considered it at one point and, and made a decision one way or the other. So I, I tend to think that they have looked at it and they've rejected it. So unless I'm reading this wrong, that, that's what it says in words. So I, I'm gonna accept the wording. Uh, as Indy had indicated, the staff did the warrants and, and it suggested that that's not warranted. And we sent that to the police services board. I presume they responded to that by saying, okay, we don't approve it. Um, I could be wrong, but when I read this, it says we're asking them to reconsider. Uh, so we're, we're not asking them to consider, we're asking them to reconsider. So they must have made some type of a decision and we want them to reconsider that decision. That would be my interpretation of what I'm reading. Uh, in any event, we'll probably make a whole lot to do about nothing. The bottom line is we would like a crossing guard there and the cost in the overall budget of $39 million is very nominal and it, it's a safety concern. And I think somebody said it and I'll say it again. We override warrant studies all the time. Less, can, you, can you wrap it up please? Sure. I'll be supporting this, Mr. Mayor. Is that short enough? Thank you. That's a very good wrap. Uh, so let's go to Councillor Scully. You're next. Thank you. I do have one question of staff before I lead into comments. When we do studies for to determine whether a crossing guard is necessary, is it done at random times of day or is it done during drop off and pickup times at the school or in the zone? Through the chair, the, the studies would be done during dr uh, drop-offs and pickup times. Okay. I just wanted to point that out because there's plenty of areas that are generally not busy. And I can, off the top of my head, think of, you know, in my ward, Flanders and Richter, which is a dead-end street as well. On the one end, it turns into a court and it's generally not very busy. But at drop-off and pickup time, it's absolute chaos. And I can't imagine not having... Um, a, a crossing guard in that area. Um, I feel that we as counselors and staff, you know, we can't be everywhere all the time. We can't, we can't see these little issues as they come up and we, we really rely on the residents to bring these, these situations to, to our attention. So I do want to give a huge shout out because it's not, it wasn't an easy process uh, to this mother who came out today um, who had to fight way too hard to advocate for the safety of her child and for all the other uh, children who walk to school there. And I'm happy to support this tonight. Thank you. Councilor Carpenter, next. Thank you. I too will be supporting uh, the, this resolution, requesting that the Police Services Board reconsider its decision unless the wording changes. Um, you know, uh, and the, I believe Elizabeth was a mother's name. She's courageous for coming to council and speaking on behalf of her children and the other children at, at school. And I, I appreciate that. And her, I hope her neighborhood and her school appreciates that as well. That takes great courage and I appreciate her coming forward. And I will be supporting her request for a safety patrol at her crossing guard, sorry, a crossing guard at her school for the safety of her child. Um, we talk about the cost of $39 million budget and the cost of $7,000 for, um, for a crossing guard. Um, it, it, it's worth the savings to protect the children in the school that don't have a crossing guard. You know, but the problem is bigger than that. We need to do something more than just this. Uh, I, I'll support this for sure because it's the right step. 
but we need to have a meaningful discussion with both school boards, both the design of the schools, the drop-off areas, their pickup areas. There's opportunities to fix a lot of things going in a lot, through a lot of school boards, both school boards, the separate and the public, where we can actually make the drop-off and pickup safer. Uh, if we could have some consultation with the construction sector, uh, the capital sector of the school boards and our own capital department as well, engineering, we could look at ways to solve a lot of these unsafe drop off and pick up areas that are crowded during the beginning of school and after school. There are lots of options to, salute, to find solutions to these if we had such a committee where they actually work together to look for these solutions. Thank you. Councilor McCurry, next. Mayor, thank you very much. And I look forward to hearing uh, more about Councilor Carpenter's notice of motion coming to us to deal with that important issue. And I'd be happy to help him in, in drafting if he would see fit. Um, Mark, uh, Mr. Jocklin, could you, could you elaborate a bit on who does the warrant and the process uh, for that to land on somebody's table? Through the chair, there's uh, the warrants done by one of our uh, transportation technologists. So by, by city of Brantford, not police. Correct. Okay. And it's basically a site inspection. And we look at a warrant evaluation process that's outlined in the uh, OTC guideline for crossing guards. Okay. And uh, you don't care how much it costs, do you? That Sorry. doesn't figure into your warrant study. You don't, you don't decide whether whether a school is worth 7,000. It's, it's, it's math, right? Correct, uh, study. staff work off of policy and uh, guidelines. Yeah, okay, thank you. So um, there's been a lot said tonight about trying to save $7,000. And um, I wouldn't say that that's a red herring, but I'd, I'd say that it's completely immaterial to the discussion before us tonight. Um, this was um, a decision made, or a decision not made rather based on information. Uh, and uh, so, I don't know whether it was discussed at police services. I, I was probably prior to my time, if it was, I heard from somebody on the board earlier this evening that said that it, it never landed on their table or it didn't come to a vote at least. But um, what we have before us tonight is, is a, it's a community initiative started by folks who, who actually care enough to get involved, which is so rare these days um, for somebody to actually get up from behind the keyboard and walk in here and make a presentation to us let alone take the initiative to do something positive. Um, so I, I really do think that based on that alone, it deserves uh, the recognition here tonight. Uh, I'll be supporting it. I was had, happy to support it when Councillor Wall raised it. Um, and uh, we'll, we won't be needing another warrant. We've got that information. It can go to the police services board. I happen to be a member, Councillor Martin's a member, um, and um, perhaps it'll, it'll, it'll be received favorably there. Um, yeah, it's it's a, so. Let's not go away tonight thinking. Let's not go away tonight thinking it's about seven thousand bucks because it's not. Okay, it's about community safety and the study that was done by our staff. Yeah, that's quite correct. Uh, I'd say this. Kudos to Elizabeth for coming out tonight, but uh, Elizabeth is also pretty formidable behind the keyboard. And it was interesting this came up because I'd been on council a total of nine years. I'd never heard of how you go about getting a new crossing guard because either it just happened on the construction of a new school or pretty much every school in the city already had a crossing guard. So it never has really come up. I've never seen it. So when that request crossed my desk, I'll admit, I'm missing, I knew that the police services board, they administer the program. We at the city pay for it through the taxes raised. <clears throat> and as we looked into it, yes, the, the proper procedure was followed, which is the police services makes a request of our engineering staff or traffic staff do the study that uses the policies we have in place, like we have <clears throat> for stop signs and four-way stops. And so it was the advice of our staff following the policy to the police services board that the warrants for the policy didn't justify it. And so the police services board then acted on that advice. And so then Councillor <clears throat> Wall came to me and Councillor Van Tilburg and we we're kind of kicking around, well, what do we do? Well, I just said to them, you know, the buck stops here. And although we don't have the absolute right to make the decision, which perhaps we do, because this is not covered by the Police Services Act. It's not something that's within 
the uh, Legislative Jurisdiction for Police Services Board. It's just that we have an agreement that they administer it for us. So, you know, frankly, I think the decision here obviously carries a lot of weight, and I assume that the Police Services Board will act accordingly. And I'm happy to support this. We do this all this all the time. Could be with four-way stops, other other traffic control measures or pedestrian safety measures where, say, the policy, which is a good policy, very similar policy across the province, suggests perhaps, no, it shouldn't be done in this case. But then when you listen to the residents and you listen to their concerns, then you can decide, no, the policy should not necessarily be applied rigidly in every case. And good policy makers and good decision makers will make exceptions where it's warranted. And clearly, an exception to the policy is warranted here. Congratulations, Elizabeth, to you and your neighbors and the parents for bringing this forward and moving it forward in a very positive, proactive fashion. And now you're getting the end result tonight. So it's, uh, you know, it's um, a real commendation to yourself and the other parents. So I'm happy to support it. So any other speakers? I think Councillor Antoski, you want to speak a second time? I'll be very, very brief because Councilor McCurry and, and uh, you, Mayor, summed up my final comments that the policy was, was followed. There's a formula. We're here to determine what falls outside of a formula. And I think families and kids should be right at the top of that list. Thank you. Councilor Well, for a second. Yeah, I just, it's important that Again, we thank Liz for bringing this to the forefront, but I also want to give a shout out to the Neighborhood Association, uh, the principal of the school, all the neighbors who contributed to this conversation, um, going out and getting those letters of support uh, from the MPP's office. Um, these are the way that our democracy functions. And if you're a member of our community who wants to see something done or to see something done differently, contact your counselor, get a motion put on the table, spark the discussion. Um, if there's one thing that's loud and clear, it's that information needs to be more accessible. There's no reason the process for getting a crossing guard should be this difficult. You know, there's no reason for the placement of a school bus stop or the placement of a bus stop or the placement of a bike route needs to be so complicated. And I think that one of the things the city is doing is working with our staff and, and working with best practices in other communities to make information more accessible. But we still have a long ways to go. And I hope that members of our community will continue to advocate for what the community wants. Cause that's why we're here. We're here to serve the needs of the people we represent, including putting a crossing guard at a school. So thank you. So Mr. Deputy Clerk, I don't see more speakers. You could please uh, take the vote. Deputy Crossing guard request, Princess Elizabeth School carries on a recorded vote of nine to one. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Vanderstelt, Sles, and Toski, Wall of Antobor, Carpenter McCreary, Socoli, Mayor Davis. Members opposed, Councillor Martin. All right, so we'll now move back to, um, there's one item left that was separated. That's the 6.1.5, the Vision Zero Road Safety Committee report. I'm going to ask Councilor McCreary if uh, we, we're separating this, at least initially, certainly, between items 1, Erie Ave, 2, Forsyth Avenue, 4, Gray Street, and 5, Johnson Road, and we're separating out Echo Place because of that conflict I declared. So would you mind taking the chair and dealing with item number three first, and then I'll come back and we'll deal with the others. Uh, any speakers to that item? Councilor Antoski, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have a... a a question. First of all, thank you to the Vision Zero Committee. Uh, there's a lot here that's been dealt with. Uh, I'm looking specifically at item three, Echo Place, which is the one I, I have the most uh, knowledge of. And um, I, I see that we did determine that Glenwood Drive was, was not going to go through. And we certainly heard loud and clear from our, our constituents that they were uncomfortable with that. So, so I'm happy with that. I'm, I see that the four radar display signs um, for the neighborhood was um, it was changed so that it'd be distributed among the five wards and I would assume that that's because all wards are having similar issues we're all having traffic issues and and 
was has it ever been discussed that this be one of the priorities that we buy more of these so that each ward has some that, that the councillors and staff can decide within their own ward where they get moved around instead of having a couple of sets moved throughout the whole city. Was that ever a discussion? And I'm not sure who I'm asking of that. <laughs> Through the chair, it's David Ferguson, manager of traffic services. Um, yes, yeah, so at the Vision Zero committee, uh, a request was brought forward for staff to report back to the June meeting with a plan um, for consideration of, of bringing in more units and what the impacts are on that. Okay, so sorry for clarity, a discussion for bringing in more than the, the four that we're talking about for and and so there'll be dis distribution throughout the city. Do we, we, and we don't know the number yet. That's kind of going back for discussion. Through the chair, yes. Yeah. So it was whether it's four or five units per ward, uh, bring a plan back for the community to review. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilor, thank you. Any further speakers on this item? Mr. Clerk, we'll go to the vote. Item three, Echo Place Neighborhood Review, cares unanimously on a recorded vote of eight to zero. Members of the committee vote in favor are as follows. Councillors Vanderstelt, Sless, Martin, and Toski, then Toborg, Carpenter, McCreary, and Sokoli. All right, uh, so we'll deal now with the remaining items. And there is an amendment, I believe, uh, uh, Councillor McCreary has in respect to Forsyth Avenue. You just hold that for a bit and We'll get some comments. So it's on the floor for discussion. The other four items. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any raised hands. Councilor McCree might as well throw that amendment on the put the amendment on the floor. Mayor, may I say you're moving it along quite smartly tonight? Thank you for that. Well, you know, no one ever tells you I'm doing a really super job. I mean, I hear though you take it for granted. Or, yeah, that's obviously yes, what's happening. Yes. So put shame. your amendment on the floor. It's a shame. Moved by me, seconded by Councilor Martin that um, clause two of the Vision Zero Road Safety Committee report be amended by adding the following as clause C, that an all-way stop control be installed at the intersection of Forsyth Avenue and Driftwood Drive and that the necessary bylaw be presented to council. And uh, I'll speak to it ever so briefly, Mayor. So you um, do have Councilor Mar Martins seconding that? You are correct, okay. yes, Thanks. yes. You, you look surprised, Mayor. I, I don't know why that would be, but... Uh, Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, I would hope that all the uh, counselors in attendance tonight and those in attendance remotely would uh, support this initiative, uh, not an initiative of the ward counselors, but rather of the immediate neighbors. Um, so uh, they'd appreciate your support as well. Thank you, folks. Okay, seeing no other speakers, uh, Mr. Deputy Clerk, take the vote on that. Oh, sorry, Councilor Carpenter, go ahead. Just a question to staff, was there ever warrants done on this uh, stop sign? Through the chair, there was a warrant done uh, and it was in the report, it was uh, not warranted. And so it didn't meet the warrants. Okay. All right, Correct. thank you. But I will support the ward councils, just the same. All right, seeing not seeing any other speakers, Mr. Deputy Clerk, on the amendment. The amendment to item two of the Vision Zero Road Safety Committee report carries on a recorded vote of nine to one. Members of the committee vote in favor. There are as follows Councillors Vanderstelt, Sless, Marn, and Toski, Wall, Carpenter, McCreary, Sokoli, Mayor Davis, members opposed, Councillor Van Toborg. All right. Uh, so that amendment's passed. Any, any further discussion? Seeing none, Deputy Clerk, if you please take the vote on the, as amended, items one, two, four, and five.
Items one, two, four, and five as amended carries unanimously on recorded votes. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Vanderstelt, Slas, Martin, and Toski, Wall, Mentobor, Commander McCreary, Sokoli, and Mayor Davis. All right, so we'll move back to item seven. We have some notices of motion uh, where there are waiver requests for the matters to be dealt with tonight. So that's how we'll end off resolutions. We have one seven point three, Councillor Vanderstelt. Thank you, Mayor Davis. Uh, that section fifteen, uh, point eleven uh, point five of the procedure by law be waived in order to introduce the following resolutions without prior notice. Um, would you like me to read that now, Mr. Mayor? And then... Yeah, if you would read that now, and if it passes, then you don't need to read the detailed resolution again when you put it back in the book. I will. Uh, whereas Tracy Bucci was an exceptional Brantford resident with a genuine commitment to serve others, and whereas Tracy was dedicated to bettering the city of Brantford through environmental and social initiatives, such as the uh, contribution 20 years of river cleanups, through the Grand River Environmental Festival at Brant's Crossing and the establishment of the Brantford Guardian Angels. And whereas the city has recognized individuals in our community who have provided exceptional service in the interest of the city of Brantford and the community as a whole. And whereas Tracy's dedication to the community meets the city criteria with respect to naming and recognition. And whereas Tracy's legacy and betterment of the city of Brantford is deserving of such recognition. Now, therefore, be it resolved that upon conclusion, uh, upon consultation with the Bucci family and input from city staff, the staff be directed to report back to council with suitable naming and recognition and recognition of Tracy Bucci in an area as determined through consultation, including the costs, uh, installation, and design of signage and other items as may be required. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any any discussion on the motion to waive? Oh, who's the seconder? Sorry. Councillor Sicoli. All right, thanks. So uh, not seeing any hands raised. Uh, Deputy Clerk, please take the vote on the motion to waive. Through the chair, just waiting for Councillor Carpenter to submit his vote. Through the chair, just waiting for, oh, there we go. The motion to waive the rules with the required two thirds carries unanimously on recorded vote. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Vanderstelt, Slas, Marn, and Toski, Wall, and Tobor, Carpenter, McCreary, Sokoli, and Mayor Davis. So that's uh, Councillor Vanderstelt. If you please um, move your resolution, that you don't need to read the body of the resolution, but state the title and your seconder. <clears throat> Sorry, Chris, can you throw that back up there? I forgot the title. <clears throat> yes. Um, my seconder is uh, Councillor Sicoli, um, Tracy Bucci, 7.3, Tracy Bucci in naming and recognition is the title of the resolution. So do you wanna to speak to it? I would, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, but we've suffered an awful lot of loss uh, during COVID prior to and during, of course, but it's more intensely felt during COVID because so many things have changed in how we process that. Tracy, um, my experience of Tracy was that she was she was a she was an angel. She um, she was so kind, so giving, so help, helpful, so uh, so conscious of the environment around her and and the people in that environment. Um, a, a, such a long history and a dedication of making sure that um, not only. Uh, you know, does she take personal action? But she puts together an organization that takes action to um, look after our beloved spaces and continue to do that on a regular basis. Um, 
Tracy was a leader. Um, Tracy would call on members of council on a regular basis and have us work with her and with her teams, with her groups uh, to contribute to our community, um, contribute time, contribute funding um, toward that common goal of making sure that we leave Brantford better than when we found it. She, she lived by that mantra, she, she lived that example. Um, so much of her passion went into that sense of community. When she worked with Roger Chandler for so many years, um, we spent, my wife and I spent an awful lot of time with Roger and with Tracy and uh, got to experience their, their, their amazing natures. Um, and it is, it, is, it is such a tragic loss that we have lost Tracy. Um, and what I'm hoping for is, is we can find the most appropriate spot that, um, that serves to answer one of those, one of those questions that Tracy had us ask ourselves, do we want to live in a clean or a messy city? Do we, do we want to take care of our jewel, the, the Grand River? So what, one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to ask of our staff and of the family as well is to make sure, uh, that we pick the most appropriate spot. Uh, for her, her uh, for, for, for something that is uniquely tailored to everything that Tracy was and everything she represented. So I, I respectfully ask for your support. Thank you. Councilman McCreary. Mayor, thank you. And uh, a good initiative by Councilor Vanderstill to bring this forward. Uh, she was a genuine person and cared and did a lot in this community. Uh, I hope the mover and the seconder have in mind uh, to properly celebrate memories of her at uh, whatever uh, celebration of, of the uh, naming event is going to happen, um, and um, that way we can we can we can uh, hear from people at a, a more appropriate venue necessarily than than here at a council meeting uh, where we're debating a lot of other topics today. Next, uh, Councillor Sless. Pardon me, Councillor Carpenter, you're next, I think. Yes, thank Councillor you. Carpenter. Yes. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Councillor Van Vanderstel, for bringing this forward. Uh, I was thinking about ways to recognize Tracy. And you mentioned Roger Chandler. Uh, we did recognize Roger Chandler. He, uh, when he passed, unfortunately. He was involved every year with Tracy in that cleanup of the river. Uh, and when Roger passed, we recognized him by a plaque at Shallow Creek Park only because that was his favorite park. That's what his wife said he was there every morning. So we did that, you know, uh, and, and every year at Branch Crossing, uh, Tracy's uh, followers and friends and, and, and a member of council, every member of council pretty much showed up there one time or another, was involved either with the, with the hot dog, with the barbecue or with the cleanup itself or both. Uh, and she um, made us aware of how important the river was. And she did, she was a tremendous individual, uh, Branford, Booster. I mean, we. Uh, I think Branch Crossing might be a, a, a great location, uh, but I'm just uh, have to talk to the family. Uh, you know, the um, May was when we would do the cleanup in that location, usually early May. So I, I don't know if it's too early to be able to make that timeline to, to recognize her, uh, but she sure, certainly deserves the recognition. Uh, and I wonder if we should be looking at ways. Is there ways that we could? That we could find that we could recognize the Brantford uh, boosters, the Brantford uh, leaders uh, that have really promoted our community and really taken an active role in our community, uh, like Tracy, so that we could recognize them on a regular place or a regular basis. I know we have uh, uh, other venues for other individuals, but uh, uh, Tracy certainly deserves the recognition. She was uh, always positive. Sometimes she couldn't get the funding, and we, <laughs> I remember deep in the dig into the pocket when, when she couldn't get the funding out. And we all reached into our pockets and provided some funding to make sure that the river cleanup could happen. Our park staff helped out. Uh, the community got behind Tracy in the endeavor because it was so positive. Uh, and it was, uh, you know, only took a day for most of us, but it took her most of the year to put all this together. So she certainly deserves a recognition. I will support anything that comes forward. And I thank the, the mover in the second for bringing this forward. It, it is a sad day when I heard that Tracy's passing. That's for Schlitz. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yes, I, I too would like to thank uh, Councillor Vanderstelt and uh, Councillor Sicoli for bringing this forward. I, it, it's 
it's extremely appropriate. It's uh, our community is much poorer on, on Tracy's passing. It, it, uh, we, we lost a good one, and, and, and it's a shame. Uh, the, the one thing that uh, always bothers me when, when we get into these types of situations and we're honoring somebody, I wish there was a way that we could honor them when they knew they were being honored and do them when they're living, not after they've died, but when they're living to say thank you in person um, that you've done some yeoman's work in, in this city, whatever that endeavor was, and that they know that they were appreciated and, and what they've done was significant and was valued by the city. I think that's really important, Mr. Mayor, and I think that's something that should be looked at. Uh, and and I, I would hope too that the, uh, as has been suggested, that there's locations been suggested, but I, I hope they would be meaningful and, and Grants Crossing certainly sounds meaningful, but not just a sign stuck on, on the side of a building, or something, something meaningful and, and something grandeur that when you look at it, um, in, in 50 years from now, when somebody reads that sign, um, they might not understand what went on, but they'll know that person did something uh, significant for the community. And, and I think that's really important to leave that legacy behind because uh, she certainly was deserving of this. I think we all had conversations with her, like uh, Councilor, or Councilor uh, Carpenter said, usually it involved money because she did everything on a shoestring, but, but she did it. And, and I think that that's what was important. And uh, yes, like I said, we're, we're truly poor on her passing and certainly our condolences go out uh, from the city to, to her family because um, she was certainly valued by the community. So thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilor Well. Thank you, Mayor Davis. And thank you to the mover and seconder for bringing this so that we can have an opportunity uh, to speak and honor the memory of an incredible human being. Um, I don't think there's many people you could mention Tracy's name to in our community who wouldn't immediately know who she was. And uh, I just want to share just a quick my experience. Um, there's many types of leaders. There are leaders who talk about doing things and they never get done. And then there are leaders who do all sorts of talking about doing things and they do them. And then there are people who just get it done. And that was Tracy. Tracy didn't have, at least in my experience, a lot of time for talking. You show up at her clean, you started cleaning. You got the work done. You didn't sit around talking about how much you were going to be cleaning. You didn't sit around talking about who was going to do what. You just followed the leader. And that was Tracy. She wasn't a boss. She never told anybody what you had to do or where to do or what to do. Just show up and get to work. And the world needs more Tracys. It needs people who just go out there and get things done. And that's just her cleanups. We also talk about her advocacy, helping people in our community. She saw people in our community who needed help. And instead of talking about it, she just showed up and provided food and blankets and help. And people rallied behind her because she was incredible. And uh, the world needs more Tracys. And I am so thankful that I met her and then I got to know her and I had only wished that I had met her sooner. Yeah, I would echo a lot of those comments. Um, I'd heard a lot about Tracy prior to becoming mayor. And I can re recall very distinctly the first spring and uh, Tracy personally invited me to the river cleanup at Brant's Crossing. <clears throat> and I remember arriving and thinking, how does someone collect so much garbage? And everybody was very passionate, enthusiastic. And, and you know, that, that was really the most impressive leadership skill I thought that Tracy had was how she was able to inspire that, the, the, all the people and volunteers that work with her and inspire them year in, year out over the course of decades to do that. And uh, certainly a major impact on our river making as river aware and what we can each do to make our river better. And then, and then the advocacy followed that and she had a really neat way of advocating that wasn't demanding, but you just got swept up in the passion that was really truly amazing about Tracy. And <clears throat> you're right, many of the commentators were in very much miss her and uh, very happy to support this resolution to recognize the, the legacy and the contribution of Tracy to our community over many decades. So with that, not seeing any other raised hands, Mr. Deputy Clerk, please take the vote on that.
Item 7.3, Tracy Bucci, naming and recognition, carries unanimously on the recorded vote. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councilors Vanderstelt, Sless, Martin Toski, Wall, and Tilburg, Carpenter, McCreary, Socoli, and Mayor Davis. So, Councilor McCreary, I'm going to ask if you would uh, take over chairing again. I have a resolution I'd like to bring forward. Mayor, thank you. Who's your seconder? Uh, my seconder, Councilor Vanderstelt. Thank you. And uh, you've got the, is this is a waiver of the rules to begin with? Yes. So Would I you like to read that in its entirety, Mayor, please? Yes. Uh, that section 15.115 of the procedural bylaw be waived in order to introduce the following resolution without prior notice. Whereas on March 11, 2020, the World Health Organization declared coronavirus a global pandemic. And whereas section 4.1 of the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act makes provision for the head of a council to declare that emergency exists in the municipality or any part thereof, and also provides the head of council the authority to take such action or make such orders as he or she considers necessary and are not contrary to law to implement the emergency response plan and respond to an emergency. And whereas in accordance with Article 8.1 of the Municipal Code Chapter, I execute a declaration of emergency for the Corporation of the City of Brantford on March 19th, 2020. And whereas at a special city council meeting held April 16th, 2020, that the Council of this Corporation acted by law 44 2020, being a bylaw to delegate authority for decisions to the mayor and the chief administrative officer during the COVID 19 declared emergency. And whereas the same meeting, the chief administrative officer had been directed to bring ongoing reports to council for review detailing the decisions that were made pursuant to the COVID 19 delegation of authority bylaw, as well as the Emergency Operations Center to date. And whereas the Emergency Management Planning Committee has agreed the need for an ongoing emergency coordination management is no longer required. And whereas on March 3rd, 2020, I terminated the declaration of emergency for the city of Brantford. And whereas there are still several bylaws, they're on the books, they're no longer required as the city transitions back to pre-pandemic management. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the following uh, that a bylaw to repeal the following be presented to council later this month for consideration. One bylaw 41 2020, which is a bylaw to establish acting mayor appointments during the COVID 19 pandemic. And two bylaw 44 2020, which is a bylaw to delegate authority to the mayor and the CEO during the emergency declared by the head of council pursuant to section 41 of the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act in response to the COVID 19 pandemic and that the CAO transitioned to providing urgent updates and reports regarding EOC operations through an electronic memo update to council. Mayor, thank you. And you can, can you state briefly why uh, the need to waive the rules tonight? Yeah, so this can uh, move to council this month. And it's, uh, it, it's the, the declaration of emergency has been declared over. And so this is to clean up the bylaws that uh, still remain on the books that really should be cleaned up and cleaned up in short order. Thank you. Any discussion on this before we go to the vote? Motion to waive the rules. Cares unanimously on recorded votes. Members of the committee voting in favor are as follows. Councilors Vanderstelt, Celeste, Martin, and Toski, Wall of Tilbor, Carpenter, McCreary, Socoli, and Mayor Davis. Uh, Mayor, go ahead and give us the abbreviated version. Stay yes. your seconder. So it's moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Vanderstelt. Uh, repeal of COVID-19 related bylaws. If I might be able to speak to it. You didn't want me to read it again, did you? Much as I love the sound of your voice, Mayor, I, I owing to the lateness of the hour and our, our practice, uh, no. Good, because you're doing a super job filling in for me. So there are two things that... Uh, that we're doing with this one, it relieves the CAO of the, the requirement to report, provide that report at the end of each month, uh, which some have questioned whether that even was appropriate. But more importantly, I think more significantly, uh, you recall that shortly after this council, this term began, we appointed uh, uh, Councillor Udley as the deputy mayor to fill in when I was couldn't perform my duties for an extended period of time. And then through this bylaw, what we did almost two years ago was we set up a, a different arrangement where if I couldn't act, it was going to be Councillor Weaver and Councillor McCreary and Councillor Toski. And so that was required by the COVID pandemic and the emergency declaration. And so I think the major impact of this particular resolution and the 
following bylaw will be to have us revert back to having uh, Councillor Utley as a deputy mayor for the balance of this term. So, uh, and it really is just cleaning up loose ends uh, from the declaration of emergency. Thank you. Mayor, thank you very much. Speakers to this, folks? Uh, I see none. I do have one question. Um, can the member of staff state uh, when uh, we'll be able to return to normal practice here in the city of Brantford by having advisory committees and boards meeting in this building in person? To you, Mr. Chair, Brian Hutchings, CEO. I know that was a matter of report coming from the clerk. I believe it's uh, coming, it was reported on by uh, GM DeVries last month. It'll be coming this month uh, with a, with a uh, recommendation as when they will begin the, the advisory committee. So sometime this month, the report will be coming forth. And without spoiling the surprise and eliminating the tension, uh, will that date be May the 1st? <laughs> Actually, I, I would answer if I knew. I, I don't know the answer, to Council, uh, Mr. Acting Chair. Let me let me ask you to take my comment under advisement. Then, okay. No further discussion on this. We'll go to the vote again. Uh, Chris, please. Item 7.4, repeal of COVID-19 related bylaws, carries on a recorded vote of 10 to zero. Members voting in favor are as follows. Councillors Vanderstelt, Sless, Martin, and Toski, Wall, and Tilbor, Carpenter, McCreary, Sokoli, Mayor Davis. Mayor, the chair is yours. Thank you very much, Councillor McCreary. So we have two notices of motion. And Councillor McCreary, if you could please read the title of your notice. Uh, yes. Um, Police Services Board, public engagement. And the second one, Councillor Sleps, I believe you're going to read this. This is going to be brought by Councillor Ellie, but if you could please read the title on his behalf. Certainly, Mr. Mayor. Uh, hospice Operations. So I think that uh, completes our business.